Rosh Chodesh Sameach! Yeah! Praise ya! Praise ya! All right, so this is the new moon, the new month of Adar 1. We get two of those this year. Okay, so this is the month of Adar. And so this is also our Friday night Torah study time. So we're going to start off the Torah study time. For those of you that are just showing up expecting Torah study, we're going to do our Rosh Kodesh service first. Okay, it's a very brief service. It's not very long. I know afterwards, I'd normally I talk for quite a little bit. We're not going to do that today. We're going to go pretty much, I'll give like maybe five minutes of something just to remind us about a few things, and then we're going to go right into our normal Torah study activities, okay? All right, so if you'll all rise, we'll begin with the sounding of the silver trumpet. You can stand through the whole service, most of you. If you can't, that's okay. It's only going to go about, like I said, 12 to 15 minutes. It's not very long. All right, we'll begin with the sounding of the silver trumpet. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're going to all read off of the screen as the slides come up, except for the one where I officially announce the new moon. All right, together. Yahweh, Sefatai, Tiftach, Ufi, Yagid, Tehilatacha. Yahweh, open my lips that my mouth declare your praise. May the expressions of my mouth and the thoughts of my heart find favor before you, Yahweh, my rock and my redeemer. Also in the day of your gladness and in your appointed times and in the beginnings of your months, you shall blow with the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, that they may be to you for a memorial before your Elohim. I am Yahweh, your Elohim. Kedushat Lavana, the sanctification of the new moon. O Yahweh, our Elohim, and Elohim of our fathers, make this coming month one of good and blessing. Grant us long life, a life of peace, of good, of blessing, of sustenance, of vigor, a life marked by a reverence for you and a dread of sin, a life free from shame and reproach, a life of prosperity and honor a life in which love of the living Torah and the fear of Elohim animates us, a life in which our heartfelt desires are fulfilled for good. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, amen. He who performed miracles for our fathers and liberated them from slavery to freedom, may he quickly liberate us and gather our exiles from the four corners of the earth and let us say, amen. All right, the new moon of the month of Adar is today. 
May it approve, may it prove to be good and fruitful for all 12 tribes of Israel. Amen. May the set apart one, blessed be he, grant this Rosh Kodesh to us and to all his people for life and peace, for gladness and joy, for deliverance and consolation. And let us say, Amen. Together. Blessed, praised, glorified, honored, and exalted be the name of the King of Kings, the set apart one. Blessed be he who is the first and the last, and beside him there is no Elohim. Extol him in the heavens. Yahweh is his name. Rejoice before his face. His name is honored beyond all blessing and praise. Blessed be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever. Let the name of Yahweh be blessed forever and ever. From Isaiah 66, verses 22 and 23. For as the new heavens and the new earth that I make stand before me, declares Yahweh, so your seed and your name shall stand. And it shall be that from Rosh Kodesh to Rosh Kodesh and from Shabbat to Shabbat, all flesh shall come to worship before me, declares Yahweh. Amen, amen. Rosh Kodesh Sameach. All right, you may be seated. Okay, and this will be very brief because I want to get to the Torah study. I just want to do what we do every single new moon is just to remind ourselves a few things. I want to be reminding you that, number one, we have these movements of time, these markers of time to remind us not only that time is moving, but so that we can look back on where we've come from and look forward to where we're going. Okay, that's number one. So you should be looking back to last month and said, you know what, let's see, have I made any progress? And maybe there's some areas you're really frustrated about because you haven't, but maybe there's some that you have. And whatever you haven't made, or even maybe you didn't make as much as you want to in the ones you did make progress in, then use this as an opportunity to get excited moving forward and doing better this month, all right? Please don't beat yourself up and get depressed and down and feel like you're going to quit. Because remember, the second thing that I want to mention is that you are here because he knows you can do this, all right? He called you because you can. Not because you will, <laughs> but because you can. You have free will, so you can choose whether or not you will. But he didn't call you because you can't, okay? So whether you do or you're not, that's up to you, okay? But don't start thinking you can't do it. He didn't make a mistake. He didn't pick you because you can't, all right? He knows the struggles that you're going through, and he expects you to struggle, okay? You know, without going through difficult things, you can't grow, okay? You know, I, I don't remember how I worded it on the, on the wall in the conference room, but it basically says that, you know, doing hard things equals growth. That's probably exactly what I said, right? Doing hard things is, is what leads to growth, and hard things, by the way, is literally, absolutely, 100% subjective. So I may not think something's hard. You may think it is. You may think something's easy, and I may think it's hard. What matters is it's hard to you because it challenges you. Okay, so whatever you struggle with, please don't compare yourself to somebody else and go, oh, well, I'm sure they wouldn't struggle with it. And you know what? You might be right. But there's stuff that they struggle with that you don't. So you're not really being fair to yourself, right? Okay? So just to wrap this up, again, please use these markers of time to benefit the most you can by looking back at where you came from because you, you should see some forward movement. Maybe going back one month isn't enough. Go back to the last feast, right? Feast and markers of time. Go back to last year at this time. A year is a marker of time. Where were you last year at Adar? How much have you come forward? Because sometimes it's tough, you know? You know what it's like? It's like the person that you live with who's on a diet and they've lost three or four or five pounds and you don't say anything because you hardly notice it because you see them every day. And then they go and see somebody they haven't seen in two weeks and they go, oh my gosh, you've lost so much weight. And then the person smacks you like, how come you didn't say anything? <laughs> I'm just saying because you're looking at your life the way you're looking at it, and sometimes you need the perspective of remembering where you came from because then you can see that you actually have done a lot of progress in so many areas. But sometimes you got to go back far enough to see it because it's subtle. It's not something that happens necessarily, although sometimes it does. Some of you have told me some big leaps you've made. But sometimes it's more steady and small 
And so it's harder for you to notice. You don't feel like you're getting anywhere. Okay? So get, to get perspective, go back and look a little further back. Go back to Sukkot. That was our last feast. And say, okay, that's a couple of months ago. It's back to October. Okay, you know what? Yeah, I, I think I've come a little ways since October. Okay, great. Or look at last year. You know what? Or look, go back a few years. Look where you were before you came into all of this. Don't forget, you know, there's a scripture. Actually, there's a lot of verses that say this in the, in the uh, Chumash, in the first five books. Don't forget where you came from. In other words, don't forget what you were a slave in Egypt, so to speak. Is don't forget where you came from. Okay? And the reason is two things. One is so you don't go back. And the other is so that you can see how far you've come. Amen? Amen. All right. So hopefully that will be encouraging to all of you. Okay? So with that, I'm going to bring up Elder Billy Jackson, who's going to lead us through our normal Torah study activities. All right. Shabbat shalom. Come on, you can do better than that. Shabbat shalom. All right, all right. So we're going to start our tour study as we normally do with prayer and praise. So if you have a prayer of praise, you can start typing it in online. Our Shamish team is online uh, to moderate the room. If you're here locally and you have an urgent prayer of praise, uh, you can come up to the mic. Watch, there's not going to be anybody coming to the mic. <laughs> oh, Miss Amy's coming. All right. Just a reminder, we want to keep it to the... Most urgent prayers and praises and minimize the backstories if possible. All right? Thank you. It's only urgent because I promised the girl, the woman I work with, that I would give a praise report about her husband that I asked praise for. We had that leukemia and he's getting that bone marrow transplant. He was doing so well that he got sent home a month early. And then last week or this past week, they were taking his port out. Amen. So she just wanted to thank everybody for the prayers. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. Shabbat shalom, Ashley. Shabbat shalom, Elder. Um, I wanted to come up here and praise Yahweh for the multiple memories of trials today and then also um, asking for praises and prayers. I'm going out of town this week. This is going to be a very... Uh, intense week for me from a prior walk and um, a lot of memories and stuff. So I'm going to try to get away. So if you guys can just keep me in your thoughts and prayers that things stay at bay and I stay healthy mentally. I mean, and that you don't bring the snow back with you. Usually when you go away, you come back with bring snow. So No offense, sir. I'm not going to pray for that. <laughs> <laughs> she wants you the guys snow. guys be happy. <laughs> I mean, we can certainly pray for that. All right. Nobody else here? All right. Live stream. Okay, I just got a few right now. John Barbacci, he had, he had sent me a text earlier, uh, needing some prayer for a favorable, favorable job interview. He's been applying for positions for a couple months in anticipation of a, his current job. Our company is going to go going away. So he asked, you know, give him a prayer for that. Absolutely. Lisa Hersey, prayer for guidance and wisdom. My husband was laid off from his full-time job. I think we have our tech taxi business as a fallback that Abba would open the necessary doors for the future. Amen. James Strickland, need prayer for my several medical issues. Shirley Akpalu, pray for comfort and healing for a brother-in-law. Uh, Simon Gibbs, is you know, uh, pray for work and increasing customers. I mean, some, some uh, prayers for travel mercies, people going on uh, trips. Uh, Noah Madewell, prayer for my girlfriend, Kayana, please. She's been in the hospital all day and is spending the night because of a bad seizure this morning. There's some more unspoken. Uh, some, some prayers for uh, some housing situation, lease renewals. Uh, Sandy Johnson, please pray for my ongoing left ear infection. Uh, Demelza Poldark says, uh, praise you I had four great days from severe chronic fatigue syndrome that lasted 25 years. Amen. Uh, some, some more uh, 
praises for some work some people has got some uh, some big projects coming up. Stephanie Henderson, prayers please that the new doctor I will be seeing will have the knowledge and understanding to treat the mental health issues that I have, and Abba will lead me with peace and healing. Amen. Patty Johnson, prayer for healing my lungs. Mercy has said, said prayer request, please pray for healing after a nasty fall. Uh, Carolyn G. Healing prayers for my daughter-in-law. Kenna, please. Walk softly. Pray for favor regarding disability paperwork. And I'm working on for two family members. That goes quickly and it is approved. Evangeline Agalasso. Healing for a bad cold sore on my tongue. Prayer for Jensen and Kyla and brothers Vic and Tony. Medical issues. Uh, some more prayers for people, some rental or lease renewals. Vicki Montgomery, prayer for my son and for my husband who has surgery coming up. Carolyn Devera St- Stephen, it's a prayer for my hubby's ankle and my right knee to get better. And that is it. That's got us caught up on the urgent. Awesome. Thank you. We also want to keep in prayer all those that have reached out this week. We also want a huge shout out to Rabbi Tom. I'm sure he's watching. He's out of the hospital. He's at home resting. So continue to pray for him. And I say resting. He's just at home because he, he never seems to rest. He's, he still works. He was working in a hospital. He's working at home. He never quits. I love his uh, perseverance and his, his push to do what has to get done. And uh, we really appreciate you, Rabbi Tom. We love you. Awesome. All right, who's opening us up in prayer, Mr. John Reich? Oh, Ben, Troyer, come on and open us up in prayer. Let's pray. Father, I come before you and thank you for this Shabbat that you knew that we would need. Father, I lift up these prayers and praises and uh, give them to you, expecting that you answer them according to your will. And thank you for this Torah. Thank you for, or let us open our ears and learn and grow from this teaching. And pray this all in Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 All right, readers, you can come on up. Tonight's Torah portion is Mishpatim, which means judgments. Exodus 21, 1 through 24, 18. Exodus 21, 1 through 24, 18. As our readers come up, just to give you a little background or just to give you tell you if you're just joining us for the first time what we do. So we open our services with prayer and praise. Uh, after that, uh, we have prayer, as you just heard, if you just came in the room. Uh, and then we go through the Torah portion, which again, tonight's Torah portion is Mishpatim. We go through reading Mishpatim, and we have our readers come up. I'll say a blessing over each of the readers after they're done. We'll do a blessing over all of the readers, followed by our announcements. Uh, is it you, Robinson? Rebbits and our very own Rebbits and Julie will come up and give the announcements. Awesome. Yeah, that's a treat. And then Rabbi Steve will come out and he'll do the Midrash and the Q&A. So what you should be looking to get out of every Torah portion is things that you can use and apply to your life today. All right, we're looking for things we can glean and pull out that we can apply to our lives today. So if you have any questions or comments or any insights that Abba may inspire you during the uh, portion, the Torah portion readings, make sure you take notes so when Rabbi comes up, you can share that with everyone. Amen? Amen. All right, so we're so blessed to have our first reader be Miss Rebbiton Joanne. I don't know why I call her Miss Rebbiton. <laughs> I had a Judah moment, Miss Rebbiton. <laughs> He who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may he bless Rebbiton Joanne, who's come up to honor Yahweh and the Torah. May the set-apart one bless her and her family in blessing and prosperity upon all the works of her hands. Amen. All right, Rebbiton, you're going to take us into chapter 21, reading verses 1 through 17. These are the right rulings which you are to set before them. When you buy a Hebrew servant... He serves six years, and in the seventh he goes out free for naught. If he comes in by himself, he goes out by himself. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. 
if his master has given him a wife and she has borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children are her masters and he goes out by himself. And if the servant truly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, let me not go out free. Then his master shall bring him before Elohim and shall bring him to the door or to the doorpost. And his master shall pierce his ear with an awl and he shall serve him forever. And when a man sells his daughter to be a female servant, she does not go out as the male servants do. If she is displeasing in the eyes of her master who has engaged her to himself, then he, he shall let her, her be ransomed. He shall have no authority to sell her to a foreign people because of him deceiving her. And if he, he has engaged her to his son, he is to do to her as is the right of the daughters. If he takes another wife, her food, her covering, and her marriage rights are not to be diminished. And if he does not do these three for her, then she shall go out for naught without silver. He who strikes a man so that he dies shall certainly be put to death. But if he does not lie in wait, but Elohim delivered him into his hand, then I shall appoint for you a place where he is to flee. But when a man acts presumptuously against his neighbor to kill him by treachery, you are to take him even from my slaughter place to die. And if he strikes his father or his mother, shall certainly be put to death. And he who kidnaps a man and sells him, or if he is found in his land, hand, shall certainly be put to death. And he who curses his father or his mother shall certainly be put to death. Amen. Thank you, Reverton. Next up, we have Mr. David Watson. <laughs> he who blessed our father, it's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. May he bless Mr. David, who's come up to honor Yahweh in the Torah. May the set apart one bless him and his family and send blessing and prosperity upon all the works of his hands. Amen. All right, Mr. David, you're going to take us from verse 18 to the end of the chapter. And when, when men strive together and one strikes the other with a stone or with his fist, he does not die but is confined to his bed. If he, if he rises again and walks about outside with his staff, then he who struck him shall be innocent. He only pays for the lost time and sees to it that he is completely healed. And when men, a man strikes his male or female servant with a rod so that he dies under his hand, he shall certainly be punished. But if he remains alive a day or two, he's not punished, for he is his property. When men strive, and they shall smite a pregnant woman, and her children come out, yet there is no injury, he shall certainly be punished according as the woman's husband lays upon him, and he shall give through the judges. But if there is injury, then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, lash for lash. And when a man strikes the eye of his male or female servant and destroys it, he is to let him go free for the sake of his eye. And if he knocks out the tooth of his male or female servant, he's to let him go free for the sake of his tooth. And when an ox gores a man or a woman to death, then the ox shall certainly be stoned, and its flesh is not eaten, and the owner of the ox is innocent. However, if the ox was previously in the habit of goring, and its owner has been warned, and he has not 
kept it confined so that it has killed a man or a woman, the ox is stoned and the owner also is put to death. If a sin covering is laid upon him, then he shall give the ransom of his life. Whatever is laid on him, whether it has gored a son or gored a daughter, according to this right ruling, it is done to him. If the ox gores a male or female servant, he is to give to their master 30 shekels of silver, and the ox is stoned. And when a man opens a pit, or if a man digs a pit and does not cover it, and an ox or donkey falls in it, the owner of the pit is to repay. He is to give silver to their owner, and the dead beast is his. 34? And, and when the ox of a man smites the ox of his neighbor and it dies, then they shall sell the live ox and divide the silver from it and also divide the dead ox. Or if it was known that the ox was previously in the habit of goring and his owner has not kept it confined, confined he shall certainly repay ox for ox while the dead beast is his. Amen, amen. Thank you, Mr. David. Next up, we have Grayson. He who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may he bless Grayson. Let's come up to honor Yahweh in the Torah. May the set apart one bless him and his family and send blessing and prosperity upon all the works of his hands. Amen. All right, Grayson, you're going to take us into chapter 22. You're going to read verses 1 through 15. When a, man, when a man steals an ox or a sheep and shall slaughter it or sell it, he repays five cattle for an ox and four for a sheep. For a sheep. If the thief is found breaking in and he is struck so that he dies, there is no guilt for his bloodshed. If the sun has risen on him, there is guilt for his bloodshed. He shall certainly repay. If he has not the means, then he shall be sold for his theft. If the theft is indeed found alive in his hand, whether it is an ox, donkey, or sheep, he repays double. When a man lets a field or vineyard be grazed bare and lets loose his livestock, and it feeds in another man's field, he repays from the best of his own field and the best of his own vineyard. When fire breaks out and spreads thorn bushes so that stacked grain or standing grain or the field is consumed, he who kindled the fire shall certainly repay. When a man gives silver or goods to his neighbor to guard, and it is stolen out of the man's house, if the thief is found, he repays double. If the thief is not found, then the master of the house shall be brought before Elohim to see whether he has put his hand into his neighbor's goods. For every matter of transgression, for ox, for donkey, for sheep, for garment, or for whatever is lost, which another man claims to be his, let the matter of them both come before Elohim. And in whomever Elohim declares wrong repays double to his neighbor. When a man gives to his neighbor a donkey or ox or sheep or any beast to watch over, and it dies or is injured or is driven away while no one is looking, let an oath of Yahweh be between them both, that he has not put his hand into his neighbor's goods. And the owner of it shall accept that, and he does not repay. But if it is indeed stolen from him, he repays to its owner." If it is torn to pieces, then let him bring it for evidence. He does not repay what was torn. And when a man borrows from his neighbor, and it is injured or dies, while the owner of it is not present, he shall certainly repay. But if its, the, but if its owner was with it, he does not repay. If it was hired, he is entitled to the hire. Amen. Thank you, Grayson. Next up, we have TJ. He who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may he bless TJ, who has come up to honor Yahweh in the Torah. May the set-apart one bless him and his family, some blessing and prosperity upon all the works of his hands. Amen. All right, TJ, you're going to take us from verse 16 in chapter 22 to the end of the chapter. And when a man entices a maiden who is not engaged and lies with her, he shall certainly pay the bride price for her to be his wife. If her father absolutely refuses to give her to him, he pays according to the bride price of maidens. Do not allow a practitioner of witchcraft to live. Anyone lying with a beast shall certainly be put to death. He who slaughters to an Elohim except to Yahweh only is put under the ban. Do not tread down a sojourner or oppress him. 
for you were sojourners in the land of Mitzrayim. Do not afflict any widow or fatherless child. If you do afflict them at all, if they cry out to me at all, I shall certainly hear their cry. And my wrath shall burn, and I shall kill you with the sword. Your wives shall be widows, and your children fatherless. If you do lend silver to any of my people, the people among you, you are not to be like one that lends on interest to him. Do not lay interest on him. If you take your neighbor's garment as a pledge at all, you are to return it to him before the sun goes down. And for that is his only covering, it is his garment for his skin. What does he sleep in? And it shall be that when he cries to me, I shall hear, for I show favor. Do not revile an Elohim, nor curse a ruler of your people. Do not delay giving your harvest and your vintage. Give me the firstborn of your sons. Likewise, you are to do with your oxen, with your sheep. It is to be with its mother seven days. On the eighth day, you give it to me. And you are set apart men to me, and you do not eat any meat which is torn to pieces in the field. You throw it to the dogs. Amen. Thank you, TJ. Next up, we have Shannon. He who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may he bless Shannon, who has come up to honor Yahweh in the Torah. May the set-apart one bless her and her family and send blessing and prosperity upon all the works of her hands. Amen. All right, Shannon, you're going to take us into chapter 23. You're going to read verses 1 through 17. Do not bring a false report. Do not put your hand with the wrong to be a malicious witness. Do not follow a crowd to do evil, nor bear witness in a strife so as to turn aside after many, to turn aside what is right. And do not favor a poor man in his strife. When you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall certainly return it to him. When you see the donkey of him who hates you lying under its burden, you shall refrain from leaving it to him. You shall certainly help him. Do not turn aside the right ruling of your poor in his strife. Keep yourself far from a false matter, and do not kill the innocent and the righteous, for I do not declare the wrong right. And do not take a bribe, for a bribe blinds the seeing one and twists the words of the righteous. And do not oppress a sojourner, as you yourselves know the heart of a sojourner, because you were sojourners in the land of Mitzrayim. And for six years you are to sow your land, and shall gather its increase. But the seventh year you are to let it rest and shall leave it, and the poor of your people shall eat, and what they leave, the beasts of the field eat. Do the same with your vineyard and your olive yard. Six days you are to do your work, and on the seventh day you rest, in order that your ox and your donkey might rest, and the son of your female servant and the sojourner be refreshed. And all that I have said to you, take heed, and make no mention of the name of other mighty ones, let it not be heard from your mouth. Three times in the year you are to celebrate a festival to me. Guard the festival of Matzot. Seven days you eat unleavened bread, as I commanded you at the time appointed in the new moon of Abib. For in it you came out of Mitzrayim, and do not appear before me empty-handed. And the festival of the harvest, the first fruits of your labors which you have sown in the field, and the festival of ingathering at the outgoing of the year, when you have gathered in the fruit of your labors from the field. Three times in the year, all your males are to appear before the master Yahweh. Amen. Thank you, Shanna. Next up, we have Miss Linda. He who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may he bless Miss Linda, who's come up to honor Yahweh in the Torah. May the set of our one bless her and her family and some blessing and prosperity upon all the works of our hands. Amen. All right, Miss Linda, you're going to take us from verse 18 in chapter 23 to the end of the chapter. Do not slaughter the blood of my slaughtering with leavened bread, and the fat of my festival shall not remain until morning. Bring the first of the first fruits of your land into the house of Yahweh your Elohim. Do not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. See, I am sending a messenger before you to guard you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Be on guard before him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he is not going to pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. <clears throat> But if you diligently obey his voice and shall do all that I speak, then I shall be an enemy to your enemies 
and a distresser to those who distress you. For my messenger shall go before you and shall bring you into the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hewites, and the Jebusites, and I shall cut them off. Do not bow down to their mighty ones, nor serve them, nor do according to their works. But without fail, overthrow them, and without fail, break down their pillars. And you shall serve Yahweh your Elohim, and he shall bless your bread and your water, and I shall remove sickness from your midst. None shall miscarry or be barren in your land. I shall fill the number of your days. I shall send my fear before you and cause confusion among the people to whom you come and make all your enemies turn their backs to you. And I shall send hornets before you, which shall drive out the Hewite, the Canaanite, the Hittite from before you. I shall not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become a waste and the beast of the field become too numerous for you. Little by little I shall drive them out from before you until you have increased and you inherit the land. And I shall set your border from the Sea of Reeds to the Sea of the Philistines and from the wilderness to the river. For I shall give the inhabitants of the land into your hand and you shall drive them out before you. Do not make a covenant with them nor with their mighty ones. Let them not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me when you serve their mighty ones, when it becomes a snare to you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Miss Linda. Now, last reader is going to be Valentina. He who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may he bless Valentina, who's come up to honor Yahweh in the Torah. May the set apart one bless her and her family, some blessing and prosperity upon all the works of our hands. Amen. All right, Valentina, you're going to read the entire chapter of 24. And to Moshe he said, Come up to Yahweh, you and Aharon, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and you shall buy yourselves from a distance. But Moshe shall draw near to Yahweh by himself, and let them not draw near nor let the people go up with him. And Moshe came and related to the people all the words of Yahweh and all the right rulings. And all the people answered with, with one voice and said, All the words which Yahweh has spoken we shall do. And Moshe wrote down all the words of Yahweh and rose up early in the morning and built a slaughter place at the foot of the mountain and twelve standing columns for the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent twelve, and he sent young men of the children of Israel and they offered ascending offerings and slaughtered slaughterings of peace offerings to Yahweh of bulls. And Moshe took half the blood and put it in basins, and half the blood he sprinkled on the slaughter place. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that Yahweh has spoken, we shall do and obey. And Moshe took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, See, the blood of the covenant which Yahweh has made with you concerning all these words. And Moshe went up, also Aharon, Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel. And they saw the Elohim of Israel, and under his feet like a paved work of sapphire stone, and like the heavens for brightness. Yet he did not stretch out his hand against the chiefs of the children of Israel. And they saw Elohim, and they ate and drank. And Yahweh said to Moshe, Come up to me on the mountain and be there, while I give you tablets of stone, and the Torah and the command which I have written, to teach them. And Moshe arose with his assistant Yehoshua, and Moshe went up to the mount of Elohim. And he said to the elders, Wait here for us until we come back to you, and see... Aharon and Hur are with you. Whoever has matters, let him go to them. And Moshe went up into the mountain, and a cloud covered the mountain. And the esteem of Yahweh dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. And on the seventh day he called to Moshe out of the midst of the cloud. And the appearance of the esteem of Yahweh was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain, before the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moshe went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain. And it came to be that Moshe was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Amen. Thank you, Valentina. Thank you to all the readers. Let's give them a hand. All of you did a great job. All right. And for the blessing after the Torah reading, Baruch atah Yahweh Eloheinu melech haolam asher natalanu Torah met. Bikaye Olam Nanta Bitahenu Barukata Yahweh Notain Ha Torah Amen. Blessed are you, Yahweh our Elohim, King of the universe, who has given us a tour of truth and has planted eternal life in our midst. 
Blessed are you, Yahweh, giver of the Torah. Amen. All right, let's welcome up Rebbitz and Julie to do the announcements. Okay, I want to welcome all our guests to tonight's Torah study here at Beth Shalom as well as online. <laughs> we do ask that if you are on, on, online that um, you respect the monitors that are in the room and follow the instruction that they give throughout the Torah study. So um, we offer on live stream every Shabbat our Sabbath service. And this starts at 1.15 here locally, but we do open up the room at 1 o'clock so people can chat in the room and greet each other and, you know, wish each other a Shabbat Shalom. So um, if you are visiting us for the first time tonight, we do have a Shabbat service every Saturday that you can join in with us as well. So speaking of tonight, <laughs> tonight is our local, to our local study that we offer online for all of you to, to be a part of it with us. And we do this every Friday night here at 730. But locally, we do have an Arab Shabbat meal that starts at 6 o'clock. So uh, we do a liturgy portion with each other and bless the family members. And it's just a beautiful thing to do here locally to welcome in Shabbat. But uh, we do this every Friday night, and then we open up the live stream at 7.30 so you can join in with us. All right, so next I'm going to talk about is we do have a Parsha schedule, and the Parsha schedule is on our website. It is found at m2i.org under our Resources tab, and the Parsha will give you the weekly Torah portions that we do here on Friday night, as well as a yearly study of the Haftarah, as well as the Brit Hadashah. And so you can download that, and you can follow along with us. Uh, another thing that we offer at M2i is uh, Parsha Pearls. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so Parsha Pearls is a children's program. It's a curriculum that you can do if you homeschool or just want something to give your children to do on Shabbat. Uh, this is found at yn2i.org, and we have two lessons that we offer. We have the Gem Seekers, which is for children around the ages of five to eight, and we call them the Katan Aleph children. We also have a Pearl Seekers lesson, and that is geared toward children anywhere from 9 to 99 plus. And we say that because our lessons just have a lot of great content that anybody could benefit from. And I do get emails from a lot of adults who tell me that they do, do, get, do listen to uh, or download the lessons and that they do learn a lot from it. So I get a lot of encouragement from adults that tell me they enjoy the lessons. And those are the Catan Vet and Gadol children. In our lessons, we offer child-friendly stories. We have lesson points. We have lesson questions, Hebrew word studies, memory verses, word searches, crossword puzzles, mazes, crafts, notebook pages, coloring pages, songs, and snacks. And each one is a PDF that's about 35 to 45 pages long, and it's just very robust. And um, you can email me at parshapearls at mtui.org if you have any questions about how to use the lessons, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Okay, so that's for our children. We also offer audio scripture readings, and you can find that on our website as well. So if you'd like to hear the word read, uh, we have our own Shira Wendling, who is a member of Beth Shalom, and she has read actually the entirety of scripture as well as she has done the Torah portions. She's broken up the readings into the Torah portions. So that's a nice resource for you to have as well. And we offer that for free, of course. <laughs> now I'm going to present what we offer Monday through Friday on YouTube. On Mondays, we have what is called the Look 
First Look. And these are just powerful sound bites from each week's full teaching that will come out on Wednesday. And again, that is found on YouTube as well as on our app, which I will talk about later. On Tuesdays, we offer what are called shorts and that is on YouTube. And then on our app, we have what are called rabbi trails. And these are just like one minute teachings. There's 20 of them that come out every week and those come from the teaching. And so that's available on Tuesdays. On Wednesdays, we bring out the full teaching. This week, we will be launching the Good and Trustworthy Servant Part 8. And that is also found on our app, <laughs> which I highly recommend. And I'll talk about that in a minute, how to download that. On Thursdays, we have the afterburn that we provide. And this is after the teaching is done, we open up the room for questions and comments from those locally as well as online. And so that is what we offer on Thursdays from that teaching. And then that is also on YouTube as well as on our app. <laughs> on Fridays, we bring out what is called an in-focus video. It's a short video that focuses on topics that affect our relationship with Elohim and each other. And this is just taken from any teaching. And Marty just pulls out some nuggets from a teaching. And this is on Fridays on YouTube as well as on our app. <laughs> Now, on social media, if you want to connect with us, we do have a Facebook uh, group, and that is M2I Worldwide. And our social media will post in there and uh, give you all the information that M2I provides for the Mishpacha. We also uh, have things on TikTok as well as Instagram, and you can find us at M2I underscore worldwide for both of those. And so that is how you can find us on social media if you want to interact with us. Another thing that our ministry provides is an album that Brianna has created. And these are songs that our praise team sings on Shabbat. And so this is her new album. It's called Into the Light. And it's free. Thank you. <laughs> It is free on most platforms like Apple and uh, Spotify, as well as on our app. And she also has her other CD on our app as well, which was Journey On. So that is uh, beautiful music that was written by Brianna. And so we offer that to you free of charge. Also, I'm going to go ahead and talk about now that app that I was saying you could find all our teachings on as well as the album. So we have our own M2I app, and um, you can download that, and then uh, you do that in the App Store. And then if you want to receive notifications from Rabbi, which he gave one earlier tonight, to do that, you would go to your app settings, tap your account icon, and then tap on notifications, and then go to the general and turn that on to green, and then you should start receiving notifications from Rabbi, and he usually does that on air of Shabbats. Um, what's that? Yeah, no, I said that. I said that you did one earlier. Okay, so if you didn't get one, you might want to re-download it, because sometimes there are glitches with it. I've had that happen to me personally. Whoa. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> just a little noise. Okay, another thing that our ministry offers is for the teenagers. We have our Torah teens with Rabbi Tom Mitchell, and he does this every Thursday at 1 p.m. here locally, as well as also in the evening at 9 p.m. And you would, uh, teenagers would interact with Rabbi Tom in a Zoom room, and to get the link to get into the Zoom room, you would email tourtime at m2i.org, and you will get an autoresponder link to allow you in the room. I was very privileged this week to um, watch Rabbi, um, my husband, <laughs> Rabbi Steve, do the 9 o'clock class from home. And I got to wave at the teenagers, and they were just really adorable. <laughs> I did the 1 o'clock class also. Yeah, but you didn't, I didn't get to see that one. Okay, so, <laughs> and then, because we are an international ministry, and in, 
in our efforts to work with those around the world who are part of our MTUI family, Rabbi has broken up the world into these three zones. The first one is zone one, and that is on the second Shabbat of the month. So tomorrow is our zone one for actually the Bet Shalomers to ask questions here locally. And then we'll switch that up next month with those who are MTI zone oneers, and those are people from the United States, Canada, Mexico, South America, and Central America. And this is an opportunity for you to ask questions of Rabbi, to get personal time with him so that you know your questions are answered. And so this is tomorrow during services. Um, and then we have zone two. Zone two is a Zoom room, and that is designed for those who are in countries like United Kingdom, Europe, and Africa, and we reserve time for them to interact with Rabbi, and that is also the second Shabbat of the month, and that is tomorrow <laughs> at 10 a.m. here. And to get into the Zoom room, you would email zoom at m2i.org, and there will be an autoresponder to let you in the room. So this is actually for anybody who wants to come and be a part of this. You are welcome to come, but we do reserve questions for those in those countries. And then we also have Zone 3, which are on Friday evenings after the Torah study. So our next one is next Friday, February 16th, and that will be at 10 p.m. Again, that is a Zoom, and it's email zoom at m2i.org. And this is reserved for those people to ask questions from the countries of Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Philippines, and Malaysia, and those that time zone. But again, everybody is welcome to be in there and uh, join in. And now if you're camera shy or you're shy in general and you just want to ask questions, you know, just through writing, you can email us at questions at m2i.org or actually go to our website and there you can find it under, under contact us and then we will be answering your questions that way. And then, well, tonight we had Rosh Kodesh Adar 1. I think that's the next slide. Okay. Uh, okay, the slide switched. <laughs> so it's next month, Adar 2 is going to be on Sunday, March 10th, and we will be doing that at um, 8 p.m., and there will be no meal, but afterwards we will share in desserts, or if you want to bring something healthier, by all means, feel free to do that if you're into healthy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that is in, on March 10th, and then <clears throat> the next festival we will be celebrating here locally is March 24th, and that is Purim. Yeah, so Purim will be uh, just done here locally. Of course, you're all welcome to do it in, at your congregations or your home, since we will not be live streaming this. But here locally, we're going to meet here at 5 o'clock, and we're going to bring meals to share with each other. So that's going to be really neat, and it's going to be Middle Eastern theme. And we will be reading from the Book of Esther as well. And don't forget to bring your groggers and your cheering voices. <laughs> So that is Sunday, March 24th, here locally. And then the next thing after that is we are prepping for Pesach, and we are going to... Oh, that says Sukkot. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, okay, the next slide is our craft prepping party, but it is not Sukkot, it's Pesach. <laughs> oh, wow, that is the wrong slide. Okay, let's move on. What slide is next? <laughs> Okay. Should I say someone's fired? <laughs> no, that's okay. I'll fire them. Okay. <laughs> Next should be the prep party. Okay. Did you do it's that already? A, okay. There is a prep party on March 31st. They have a slide. Where is it? It was the wrong one. It said oh. Sukkot. Oh, it said Sukkot. Oh, okay. oh, okay. So we'll fix that. Okay. Okay. It, it wasn't updated. It's Okay, so the next thing after that is at Pesach, and that is April 22nd through the 30th. So we have 326 people registered. 
We, are, we still have registration available online. You would go to our website, n2i.org slash Passover, fill out your registration form with your registration fee, and you can either send it back through online or you can email it to us. Now, if you haven't heard from us and you know you've sent it in, please reach out to us to find out if we actually did get it. Um, and uh, we also will be... Uh, having the songs for the Catan A and Catan B children that will be on the website. I'll let you know when that's out so that your children can be getting ready to um, prepare for their class time. Okay, and then uh, I guess that's all for me. Please help me in welcoming Rabbi Steve. Yay! All right. Excellent job, Rebbitson. And all of you on the live stream, please pay attention to the hall monitors. Okay, because... <laughs> okay, we've got to get you to say shamashes as opposed to the monitors. Okay, so shamashes, you're also monitors, just so you know, as you're monitoring those people. No. All right. No, I just like to tease her. She goes, it's, you know what? It's really hard to come up here and do this. I mean, I don't know how many of you could imagine getting up and having to just remember to say a bunch of stuff. And I mean, of course, you could be me and just make it all up as you go along, but that's fine. But, <clears throat> but to be able to come up and do these things. So she does a great job, and so we really appreciate that. All right. All right. Um, and then another clarification real quickly with the zone meetings. Everybody, again, just emphasizes welcome to all of the meetings. And if your country that you live in wasn't mentioned, but you're in the same range of time zones that that zone covers, that means you, okay? You're all, you're all included in that. And we list a few of the countries just to give you an idea of which sort of area we're talking about, what range of, of places we're talking about. <clears throat> okay. The year-end donor letters have gone out, so you should all have received them or be receiving them, okay? Um, if you moved, that may be a problem. Um, if you gave everything on Subsplash, that may be a problem. We're trying to get all of these things resolved. So please let us know if you're having any challenges. If you get your letter, and we've had a couple of them that have gone that way, where something was missing or not right with the number, just, just get in touch with them first, okay? The firm that sends you the letter, their name and phone number and everything will be on the letter. And, um, and then if that doesn't work out, contact us. We'll be very happy to get it all worked out. It, it, they, they're very easy to work with, and we get everything straightened out very quickly. But when we're dealing with how, how many people you know, we're dealing with, and we have over 1,000 unique donors that have given in the last year. Okay, that's a lot of people to get letters to, and we keep track of, right? Now, of course, we do have an accounting firm that does that, but they're also collecting information from us, from different venues, like some of you still use PayPal, I told you please stop doing that. Some of you use Subsplash, some of you use cash, checks, whatever, and so just keep track of everything. Easy enough to have something get a little sideways that way. So please just let us know and we'll certainly get it all straightened out. Not that any of your money went missing, just sometimes it doesn't get recorded in to you correctly. That can happen, okay? So we can get those things all cleared up. All right. Um, the pledge campaign, Okay, apparently everybody thought it was over because we've gotten almost nothing in the last week <laughs> for that. Very little has been coming in. Um, so the pledge campaign, I just want to remind you, is an ongoing thing for the next couple of years. We're not going to talk about it for a long time every week. I'm not going to talk about it for a long time now. Uh, we're very excited that we're over $970,000 pledged. Okay. So when you add in the money that had already been over the last few years given for the building fund that was not added, added into pledges, that would make it over a million dollars. That's very nice and very exciting. So we appreciate that very much. Um, if you have any questions about it, go to our website, m2i.org. Under the support tab, you'll see building project, and you can then watch a video that explains everything, and you can see a video of the, the project that we're building. We have a beautiful 3D you know, video rendering of the actual buildings. That we're, I mean, this isn't the concept that we're a video. It's an actual what the materials that we're planning to build will look like, okay? And so um, I'm hoping to announce our, our groundbreaking date soon. Had a really good meeting today with some of the agencies involved, and uh, we just have one little checkbox <coughs> to check before we can get started, and it, it's just about, believe it or not, it's about sewage. You know, sometimes you say, I've had enough of this sewage. <laughs> 
And that's where we are with this thing. It's all, we're, we're like standing knee deep in it. And it, it's just about who is in charge of, I don't know. It's, it's, it's who has the authority over how this all gets working. I can't believe it's that tough to just, you know, deal with waste, but it is. Anyway, and mostly it's been wasting my time because this has been taking forever, okay, forever. All right, so we think we've got that mostly worked out. It should be worked out in the next uh, week or two, and then we can break ground. Everything else has been approved. I mean, everything else is fine. Um, even the septic system's approved. It has to do with who's running it and how. It's just, I don't know. I can't even explain it to you because it makes no sense, okay? <laughs> if I actually explained it to you, you'd be looking like, really? That's what you guys have to deal with? You have no idea. I mean, you just have no idea, okay? All right. So that being said, I think that covers it all for my announcements. All right, good. So let's get into tonight's study. And look, we've, it's only 8.30. We might have time for everybody to make comments and ask questions. <laughs> By the way, I had a really, really good time yesterday with the uh, Torah Teens class at 1 o'clock. Uh, we had about 24, 25 different people in there from around the world. And at the, at the 9 o'clock class, this is the amazing thing, okay? South Africa is seven hours ahead of us right now, which means at 9 o'clock, it was 4 o'clock in the morning, okay? So <laughs> there were probably half the room was from South Africa at 9 o'clock at night, okay? 17-year-olds, 18-year-olds who were just saying, I need to be in here, you know? And it's funny because some of you will be like, yeah, you know, I'll sleep in. I don't need to go to something. These, these are teenagers who are showing a lot of good zealousness for this stuff, okay? And wait, and some of them were in the one o'clock thing. So they did it at eight o'clock their time at night and then did it again at four in the morning, okay? Because half the room had already, already talked to me earlier in the day, okay? So it was really great to see everybody and get to know them a little better, learn how to pronounce all the names correctly. <laughs> Um, also, what are the odds in a room of like 15, 20 people that you'd have three sets of twins? But there were three sets of twins. I mean, I, I think that's a large percentage, okay? <laughs> you know? And so, anyway. Because you don't, you don't usually find twins as, as common as that, you know? Maybe you get one set in a room this big, but, you know, there's only... Nine or ten computers logged on, and, and three of them were twins. Three, three sets of twins. Anyway, um, let's see. So this week's Torah portion is Mishpatim. Mishpatim, okay. Sure, you're clapping for judgments. You're weird. No. <laughs> judgments. These are Yahweh's judgments, okay? So let me pull out my scriptures here. Exodus 21. Make sure your phone is silenced. All right, Exodus, Exodus 21. All right, I'm going to just hit a few highlights here. This is not going to be like last time when I went into a long rant, I think. I never know. All right? And by the way, let me just say this for those of you that um, are going to watch, you know, the teachings as they come up and, you know, maybe you get to watch the live services and everything, okay? The teaching that is posting next week is not part eight. That posted this week. And I know that gets confusing. I got confused to that in the slides. I'm pointing to my wife at the moment. You know, whatever you see on the slide is the one we just finished posting, okay? So what's coming up next week is going to be this very different teaching slash service that it was a combination of last Friday night's authority rant, which went an hour and 20 minutes, and then Saturday's testimonies and continued rant about authority. That's so much a rant, but just this long thing about authority, okay? And so we're calling it the battle over authority, okay? So I'm really excited about this. It's going to be very different. And some of you get to star in it because you can't, got up to the microphone, you know? And so we'll have you up there. But I think it really was powerful to hear, okay? All right, so Exodus 21. So we begin in verse 1, of course, where we're told that this is, um, let's see, it would be helpful if I was in the right book. All right, we're, and we begin with being told that these are the right rulings, right? These are the judgments, the mishpatim. That, that, okay, which you are to set before them. So remember we talked about vertical structure just a little bit for the last week? 
And that's what I was just saying we're going to get this teaching about. You're going to get a lot of vertical structure in here. And what I need you to understand is that he's not just saying this, that, and the other thing rules-wise. He's saying you, Moses, who are the next in the vertical structure, are going to set my, the one above you's rules and right rulings before them, below you, the people. Okay? There's going to be structure. And by the way, all of these right rulings, and we're going to see a couple places I'm going to point it out, you cannot implement without a structure. There has to be a structure to bring somebody in to investigate and bring up on charges or whatever you would call it, right? Somebody's ox did this, somebody did that or whatever. Well, there has to be an investigation, witnesses, a court system. There has to be structure. So for all of you anti-structure people, you're in the wrong place. I'm not just saying this congregation. I mean, like in general, <laughs> this book does not give you that understanding, okay? Okay, Yeshua didn't show up and say, ah, forget structure. We're now like, all of a sudden, we're 60s hippies, and we're going to go live in Haight-Ashbury, and we're just going to, you know, okay, and just, you know, peace, love, and forget everything else, all right? And some of you are so young, you have no idea what I'm talking about, okay? <laughs> go to Woodstock. All right, so, but the thing is, all right, we have to understand that when we're reading things, there's other things that are understood, implied, or, to, or supposed to be understood. Like these things require other things. One of those other things is authoritative structure, okay? So, the strange thing that comes up in verse 2 is the very first thing after the Ten Commandments, after they said, don't tell us any more, Moses, we don't want to hear it, let him talk to you, is dealing with slavery. Okay? Now, not the way you would think as a modern-day 2024 person that clearly God would just tell them that slavery is wrong and nobody should be doing these things. And so we, we can't understand all that he does and why he does it when he does it. Okay, so bear in mind, this was not written to you. It was written for you down the line, but it was written to them at a time when these things were how things were going on, okay? And you can say, well, well why wouldn't he just do that? There's a lot of things I would say, why wouldn't he? You know what, he's not me, and I'm glad he's not me, and I'm glad I'm not him with all of his responsibilities, okay? Remember, his thoughts are not your thoughts, and they're so high above our thoughts as the heavens above the earth. So we don't understand why he causes or allows. So let's not get all confused and wrapped up in all our wokeism and everything else to think, oh, well, see, so throw the Bible out because, you know, he says here, when you buy a Hebrew servant or a slave and he serves, oh, so there's rules about slavery. Remember, we're dealing with a different world, okay? I mean, I know that it's hard to understand. I mean, I could take some of you here, you Americans, and stick you into parts of like Africa or South America or India, you know, where you will never see indoor plumbing, where you will never see anything but dirt floors. We will not, see, you don't know what you don't know, okay? Because you live in a very modern world. And most of the world, a good chunk of it is modern. There's a good chunk of it, but there's a lot of the world that isn't. But you go back then, that world is not this world. And so please stop applying your morality of now to this book, which is dealing with then. Oh, but why would God? I don't know why he allowed what he did. But he's the same one that tells me my sins can be forgiven. He's the same one that tells me I can have eternal life. He's the same one that says he's not a respecter of persons. He's the same one that says this, well, all the good things you could add to that list, Okay. So this section always bothered me. I was like, why would he make rules for this stuff? Why wouldn't he just tell them to knock it off? I mean, after all, they just were slaves. And so, and by the way, some people say, well, they weren't really slaves like we think of because, you know, it was really like a, a servant who was like a, you know, like, a, like, I don't know, like a maid or a butler type of thing they're thinking. No, look, there's verses in here that says, if you beat your slave and he doesn't die in three days, no harm, no foul. That's a slave. Okay. And by the way, I want you to know, those verses tripped me up for a long time. That bothered me. 
And what didn't, it wasn't so much bothering me because of what it said, but trying to figure out why he would say it and why that would make any sense, okay? So if any of you are struggling with that, I get that. I did too. Okay, but this is where we have to understand it's hard to judge, which is what you'd be doing, judging what he said to these people from where you're sitting right now, okay? Because you don't know that world that he was trying to give them guidance in at that time. It made sense, at least to him, at the time to do it this way, all right? That's all I can give you for that. I just want you to make sure you're thinking this through and recognizing context, context, context. And what's, in the, what's context? Number one is who's speaking? The creator of the universe. He's talking to Moses, telling him to talk to the people. Where are they? Well, they're at Sinai. They just heard the Ten Commandments. When are they? Like 4,000 years ago. <laughs> okay? This is a long time ago. It's not now. These are all things that may or may not make a difference when we ask the question about context. When something's happening may be significant. Who's speaking is significant. Who's the audience is significant. What's going on? He's giving them instruction. That's what's going on. This is when he started with the Ten Commandments. This follows immediately after that. Okay? And by the way, let's not for a second, <laughs> because this is where the Adventists go completely off the rails, don't for a second think that somehow these are different or some sort of punishment than the ten, okay? The people interrupted him. Now, I think he already knew they would, which is why he planned it to be ten. But the people said, hold on, stop, we can't hear this, we're going to die, okay? And so they said, you, you go ahead and continue giving your rules, but give them to Moses, don't give them to us, we don't want to hear it directly which I always believed was intentionally or unintentionally their way of creating a plausible deniability because they weren't getting it directly like they were from the Sinai mountain with the first ten. Because then they go and say, well, Moses told us. Well, he didn't know if he was right or wrong. You know, how are we supposed to be sure to believe him? Even though with certain signs, Yahweh said, do these things so that they will believe you forever. Now, by the way, we're still part of that forever trying to believe what Moses said all these years later, okay? But that's really <laughs> what's going on here at the beginning. There's this big challenge where the people are now gonna have to have Moses explain. He's gonna explain everyday life situations. He's setting up their judge or judicial system. Basically their legal system of if people do this, this is the ramifications for that. If people do that, this is the ramification for this. And this is how you handle things. And we're gonna get a lot of that all the way through to, Deuter all the way through to Deuteronomy. You're gonna get it through the rest of Exodus, the Numbers, and, and Leviticus, and, and, and Deuteronomy. You're gonna get all of this. It's gonna be continuing, little adding and adding, little more and more, of understanding the right rulings from above. So that no matter what comes up, they would know how to handle it, but they have to handle it within a structure that he was building, okay, an authority structure, not just any structure, but an authority structure. All right, then we get down to, um, <coughs> excuse me, we get down to verse six, and it talks about the servant who says, I love my master, in verse five, my wife and my children, let me not go free, because he wants to keep his family, and his master shall bring him to the doorpost, and it talks about piercing his ear with an awl, and that he shall serve him forever, okay? Now, we do have some visuals here. We got the ear, we got blood, we got a doorpost, okay? So the ve'ahavta, everybody should understand what the ve'ahavta means. It means, and you shall love, right? This is Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, which says, and you shall love Yahweh, your Elohim, with all your heart, strength, and being, and then continues on. At the end of that, it says, and you shall write these things on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So doorposts, and covenant and Torah were connected, okay? So the Vahafta was Torah written on the doorpost. So this man is brought to a doorpost, okay? What's the ear represent? What do you do with your ear? Shema, you hear. Okay, so there's a hearing the voice. 
Remember we're talking about in chapter 19, if you will obey my voice. So the, the, the device that hears the voice is brought to the place where the Torah is written, and then blood is drawn with the all piercing into the doorpost, and blood is represented to what? Covenant. Because blood and covenants are almost always together. There's the blood of the covenant. We know that about Messiah, but we also know that about the, the Old Testament. When they actually go to ratify the covenant, Moses with the temple ends up sprinkling, sprinkling blood on all the people. Why blood? Why blood? Well, who said that? What'd you say? Life. Very good. Melissa said life. Very good. We're told that the life is in the blood. So the shedding of blood represents your life level. The level of commitment is a life level commitment. You know, you go back into ancient times and different cultures where they would actually cut themselves and shake hands to, to mingle, making a blood oath. The shedding of blood was part of that, but it goes all the way back. Yahweh uses it here. Blood is part of covenanting. And so this person who's saying, look, I'm going to stay voluntarily. I want to have my wife and my kids, etc. So you're going to take them and you're going to pierce their ear with the awl into the doorpost and he shall serve them forever. That's okay. So the Hafta Torah written on the doorpost, the Hafta represents Torah written on the doorpost. The ear is the hearing the voice and blood is the covenant. Okay? So this is, this is a picture that's going on here. Then we get to verse 10, and it says, And if he takes another wife, her food, her covering, and her marriage rights are not to be diminished. Okay, so look, I'm not ever going to say you should go out there and get a second wife. Because I think you're crazy. And I, look, I love mine. And I'm telling you, if you're married and doing it right, that should take up all your attention. Not because they're so tough, because you're tough too, and you should take up all their attention easily if you're doing this right. I don't know why you would think it would make sense to bring in another one. Okay, I find it challenging enough to deal with one. Not because she's, just the idea of, as a husband, to do the role and the things that are needed. So I think guys are thinking with other parts of their body wanting something like that. Look, but what it said was, back in, remember again, this is today, I'm thinking like a 2024 person. The world was different then. Look, I know this is still a dangerous world for women. Not like then. Okay? Mostly, women are safe to live on their own, to get their own jobs, take care of themselves. They, most women can take care of themselves. Most, meaning more than half, right? The majority. Now that being said, in this world, a woman unprotected was going to be taken, raped, killed, something. Okay? So to take in a second wife, a woman that would not otherwise be covered, protected, might have made sense in that society. But remember, in that context, it's something being done for her, not for you, gentlemen. Okay? Also, I've yet to find a verse where it talks about more than one wife where the original, the first wife, was not the one who initiated it. Now, there's a couple of places we find out that someone's a part of multiple wives. We don't know how it got started, okay? We see this with, with um, uh, Samuel's mother, right? She was not the first one. But it doesn't say how that got started, but we see this with, we see this with Sarah. We see this certainly with Jacob and all of his mess. The wives are bringing on the other wives. Jacob isn't going around looking for another wife. Neither was Abraham. We don't see this. So gentlemen, knock it off. Okay? If your wife is not initiating it, you've got nothing to say. Now, we got another problem. It's illegal in this country. So if you live here, knock it off. Okay? The only time we ignore man's rules is if they interfere with a commandment. Can we agree? If, if the government says so, that you have to do something and Yahweh says no, then you can't do it. If the government says not to do something and Yahweh says yes, then you have to do it. 
Like for, like, for example, there are countries where people were made to send their children to school on Saturday, work on Saturday, and they couldn't keep Sabbath. And so some, I know people personally that went to jail for that. Okay? They were in my congregation in, in Knoxville many, many years ago. They were Romanians who had spent a bunch of years in jail for refusing to work on the Sabbath. But there's no commandment to have more than one wife. To don't spin this, gentlemen, okay? Because all you're looking like is a pervert that wants more women. I'm just going to call you out, all right? That's all you look like. Now, what this verse is saying is, if you took another one, gentlemen, that first one, her rights and her position shall not be diminished, So you can't be like, oh, I'm all frustrated with this one. I've had her all these years. I'm going to go get me a new young one. Yeah, that older one still maintains her position. That is not to be usurped or diminished in any way. This This is critical. Okay, this is critical. If he takes another wife, her food, her covering, and her marriage rights are not to be diminished. Remember, the only reason to take on a second one, even in this world, was to benefit the second one and hurt, zero hurt to the first one, okay? Benefit the second one without losing or diminishing any benefit to the first one. Not real simple, is it? It certainly doesn't sound simple. Because you know what? Look at the problems that Jacob had. Each one thinking he loved one or the other one more than they loved that one. Leah was always insecure even though she was first. She always knew that he really loved Rachel because the whole thing was done as a deception. But people vying for his attention, who, <laughs> that kind of nonsense, why would you want that? Why would you do that? It makes no sense to me. Okay? Now, let's go on from there. Uh, verses 29 and 36 say something interesting. I want to just make a sort of, you know, we talk about sometimes the four levels of understanding, right? Peshat, Ramez, Drash, and Sod. So this is going to be more of a hinted at idea, right? A Ramez idea, okay? Peshat is the straightforward, simple understanding. Ramez is the hinted at, Drash is the allegorical, and Sod is the hidden. So in verse 29 it says, we're talking about an ox goring somebody in verse 28, okay? When an ox gores a man or a woman to death. Okay, it's, it says it will certainly be stoned, etc. But however, if the ox was previously in the habit of goring and its owner had been warned and he kept and he has not kept it confined so that it has killed a man or woman, the ox is stoned and the owner is also put to death. This is the hint is that be aware of everything in your life that you're, that you're knowing it, you're responsible for what you know. I should say, more importantly, you're responsible for what you do with what you know. So he's saying, if you knew that your ox had a habit of doing this, and then you didn't keep that ox confined, you're to blame. You're to blame. Now, if you didn't know when the ox had never done anything, that they, it's different. But it's saying, if you knew, you had been warned, you know? Look, we see this again at the end of the chapter, verse 36. It says, or if it was known that the ox was previously in the habit of goring and its owner had, n- had not kept it confined, he shall certainly repay for the ox. So this is when an ox, uh, when the ox of a man smites the ox of his neighbor. Now we're talking about ox for ox. So now, he shall certainly repay ox for ox while the dead beast is, at, is his. So in other words, it's almost like you bought that dead beast. Now you gotta replace it. Dead beast is yours, now you gotta replace it. You gotta take ownership for those things that are under your vertical structure. Those, those, those beasts belong to you, then whatever they do reflects on you. That's a, that's a pattern you see in all of the vertical structure. Everybody below anybody else has to know that whatever they do reflects on the one above them, or all of the ones above them, okay? I mean, what you guys do reflects on me, but it also reflects on the ones above me, and especially Yeshua and the Father. I mean, so it still keeps going up. But you gotta start with you. Anybody, if you're in any part of the structure, you're a husband, you're a wife, you're also a mother and father, well then what you have as a mother or father is that what those children do 
you are certainly responsible up to a certain point. Up to a certain point. While they're children. When they're adults, now they're responsible for themselves. But when they're under your structure, under your house, if they go out and do something, guess what? Even the governments today will hold you responsible. Very often for things your children do. Husbands, your wives, they go out and do things. Why do you think we're going to get to in the book of Numbers this vow annulling thing? Like this annulling of vows because whatever they do is on you if you allow it. Okay? I know ladies, you don't like that if the guy jumps in and says no. or to, But it's, you know what? It is on him if he allows it. Okay? And it's his choice if he wants to allow it or not. Or be that, let it be on him. You may be okay with it being on you, but he may not be okay with it being on him. And don't be all like, well, I'm a grown woman, I'm a grown woman, I can do whatever I want. Well, you know what? But you're married. Now you're in a structure. That doesn't mean you're not a grown woman anymore. It just means you're in a structure. And you have to recognize that you don't have all the freedoms of being a single grown woman. Where you really were not under that kind of a structure. You were under the next level of the structure. The higher level, which didn't have as direct interaction with you as a husband would. Or when you were younger, a father or mother would. Okay? And so you want the benefits of the structure. You want him to take care of you. You want him to provide for you. You want him to keep you safe. But you don't want him to say anything that you don't like or to tell you no. You can't buy that. You can't do this. We can't afford that right now. No. It's a full package. Okay? You can't just want the parts you like. (laughs) <laughs> all right, you can't just like, well, but I like when he keeps me safe, I like when he's making all this money, I like, but I don't want him to tell me no. <sighs> okay? You, you, can't, you can't do it that way, it doesn't work that way, all right? Look, I'm going to get myself in all kinds of politically incorrect trouble here. There are those in society that want to argue about, you know, what a, what a marriage is. Like, is it between a man and a woman or whatever it is? Now they're even arguing what a man and a woman is. But before that, it was simply was it just between a man and a woman. Things have certain definitions, okay? Marriage as originally defined. I'm not going to argue with all the new woke people out there. But marriage as originally defined was a man and a woman. Well, guess what? I'm not going to argue about that. That's not the point. The point is... And in a marriage, there's a thing called a husband and a wife. And those are defined terms. Of course, everybody wants to redefine those terms to their best interest. But they are what they are. Which is why I did a lot of teachings, elders and a bunch of teachings, on trying to understand the roles of men and women and understanding marriages. But those roles are already defined from the above. Okay? And you... Well, I promise you, will not do well fighting against the way he designed it. It won't work. Short term, you may think it's working, but it's going to blow up in your face. Because you're trying to do something against how he designed it. And so, do that as you want, at your own risk. Okay? He designed it. He made them, man and woman, He had Adam and Chava be the first husband and wife. He defines the roles. And so some of the roles, I would actually actually go differently and say all of the roles, but let's go with some of them. Some of them you will recognize. How's that? Some of them you will recognize right away benefit you. If you're the man or the woman, it doesn't matter. Some of the roles of the other one will benefit you. Right? If you're the man, some of the roles of the wife, you will immediately realize you you are benefiting. If you're the wife, some of the roles of the husband, you will immediately realize they're beneficial to you. It's hard to recognize that all of the things of the role actually benefit you. Because some of them, up front, hinder your I want, I want, I like, I want it, don't tell me what to do, whatever. Your sovereignty. Okay? Your sovereignty gets challenged. And then the thing gets really upside down because then you want to usurp his sovereignty. And then you look at me and say, but he has no idea what he's doing, which is also part of the problem. Okay? Because you're right. A lot of the men don't. 
And that does create very challenging households, okay? But your jumping in front of them does not, I promise you, make it any better. It only makes it worse. Better you should bring both of you to counsel and try to get that sorted through. Okay, ladies, jumping out in front, well, well, if he doesn't do it, I gotta do it. Well, then you're only making things worse. Better to get help, okay? Because, you know, emasculating your husband or, or stepping over him or putting him down and crushing him is not gonna get you the man you ever want. You'll never get that man because he'll never become that man. Okay, and men, don't hear, I know some of you are hearing what I didn't say, which is you're hearing, see, I told you, honey, that you gotta, just, you know, no, I didn't say that you have any excuse because they're doing that. You should step up no matter what they're doing. Don't use what I said as an excuse, see, well, see, it's her fault. No, you let her do that. That's why it's the fault, okay? Look, I'm not gonna give you any dirty laundry about my house, but can any of you imagine me letting Rebbitson do any of that? Okay? You understand? Whether she would try or not, I'm not saying she does or not. I'm just simply saying is when you see a man who's going to say, no, this is what it is. See, but you don't want a man that says that, but you tell me you want a man. Instead, you get a boy, and then you want to treat him like you're his mother. Let's not do that. It's not going to help either of you. Okay? So where was I on all this? <laughs> We were looking at verses, verses 29 and 36. Look, so ultimately, you are responsible for what is yours, and what, what is yours ends up doing to anybody else, okay? Okay, that's what, I just messed up my headset there. All right, okay? I mean, you are responsible. Let's look at verse, uh, we'll go to chapter 22 now, and verse nine, okay? It says, for every matter of transgression for ox, for donkey, for sheep, for garment, or whatever is lost, which another one claims to be his, let the matter of them both come before Elo let the matter of them both come before Elohim, and whomever Elohim declares wrong repays double to his neighbor. Isn't that so nice? In those days, you just go somewhere, apparently, and Elohim himself would just decide these things. See, again, I said earlier that there are things that you're going to read that absolutely, without stating it directly, imply there was something more there. This could only be done, is what I have in my notes, within an authoritative structure. You can't have every matter of transgression about all these different things be, be brought before Elohim. He's not here to bring it before. Oh, but he is through his structure. So you have to look for that structure. Which, by the way, we're not anywhere near Deuteronomy yet, but we get to Deuteronomy 17, you'll see that that structure is to be listened to when you do go before that structure. He says it right here. He says, and whomever Elohim declares wrong is to repay double. Which means that that person standing before Elohim, serving before Elohim in judgment, which is Deuteronomy 17 talks about, is going to tell you who's wrong. He's going to declare who's wrong and who's right. See, but you guys, some of you, some of you actually do this very well, but some of you do not, when you come here, you're not ready to just receive the judgment. So if I tell you, Elder tells you, Rabbi Tom tells you, no, that's just not and you ignore us, you don't like the answer, and you walk away. Because Elder and I will have conversations about so-and-so called for the 14th time. Well, what happened? They're still not doing what we told them. They're still not listening, they're still not. Then why do you come and ask? Okay? Really, I don't, I don't see the point. Because you're really getting yourself not in trouble with us, you're wasting our time, but you're not getting our, in trouble with us. Okay? And by the way, wasting our time for all of you that are going to beat yourselves up, I'm not talking to you if you come, no matter how trivial you think it is, and then we give you help and you listen. That's not wasting our time. It's all of you that come, no matter how serious or trivial, and ignore what we say are wasting our time. All right? Many. Someone said that people actually do that. Many. Many. Most of them. More than half. Okay? 
Most. You guys need to know that. Most don't do what we say. Okay? Most. If it's only 51%, I'm still most, but that's bigger than that. Okay? Probably more like 80%. Okay? Most will not do what we tell them to do. And I don't mean like we dictate or anything. We, give them, we tell them this is our counsel and guidance, and they'll ignore it. Now, by the way, we don't care, but stop coming back if you're not going to listen. What, what, <laughs> why are you coming to us if you're not going to listen to us? Because we don't care. We, and not because we don't care. You have to understand as in leadership and ministry, we cannot emotionally engage with your drama. You understand that? You may try, and a lot of you do, very hard to get us to do that. Some of you mostly don't try to get me to do that anymore because you never see me engage with it. But you'll try elder until you realize he doesn't do it either. Because you'll see him up here acting all different than I do, and then you'll go in private and try to get him to it. He won't engage either. Then you go, oh, you just sound like rabbi now. No, he's just not going to engage with your drama. Because we can't. Because we could not function being wrapped up in everybody's drama. And quite frankly, you guys all know the word I'd rather use in calling it drama. It's back to the sewage from before, <laughs> okay? Of bulls and goats. Fill in the words you want. But I'm just saying, it's nonsense, and you want us to be sucked into it. And we're not going to do that. <coughs> and then you think we're all cold-hearted, because it's like, okay, I don't care, do what you want. But don't keep calling here if you're going to do what you want. I'm not going to tell you ever you can't do what you want. This isn't a cult. Do what you want. Just stop bothering me if you're not going to listen. Okay? Because all you're doing is wasting my time with, I could be giving to somebody who wants to listen. Look, some of you have tried to call to get an appointment. I only have two days, usually a week, and that sounds like a little or a lot to whoever is listening. And I only have hour slots, seven or eight of them a day. That means that if 20 people want to get in, there's only room for eight. That's all I'm getting in is eight. And if you're one of the eight and you're wasting my time, then you're taking up a spot. Okay? And I'm not saying the issue is a waste of time. Okay? I'm saying if you're not ready to take counsel, it's a waste of time. And by the way, if you're willing to take counsel, most of the time your hour will take 10 minutes. I know you're going to think that's whatever. Oh, no, my issues are so big. You'd be surprised. Okay? And it doesn't take 10 minutes because I just give you 10 minutes and say, okay, I'm done. I'll give you my 10 minutes and you'll be like, wow, it's done. I go, do you need anything else? You're like, no, <laughs> that was it. But the point is, are you coming ready to receive? Vertical structure has to be, you have to be looking up, ready to receive, down, ready to share and to serve, okay? But you want to be in the structure, but you got to be ready to receive, it gets really tough otherwise, okay? Verse 20, in chapter 22, the phrase put up, being put under the ban is mentioned. It's a way of saying to utterly destroy. In other words, it's an idiomatic phrase. There are things in that world that you would, um, if, if you attacked another town or they attacked you, that if you won, you would get stuff as the, you know, the, the, the benefit of the battle, right? You'd get their stuff, you get their cattle, you get... But certain things, he says, they're put under the ban, meaning, no, 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 no. You don't get these things. They just get destroyed so that you're not thinking that, hey, I can go do this to just, you know, fill my pockets, so to speak, or fill my, my stable with more cattle or whatever it is, right? Okay? So when it says put under the ban, it's not like, don't picture like big yellow police tape around it or a sign with a red line through it saying it's, you know, it's banned. It literally means to be destroyed. You don't get to have it. Okay? Now... Um, verses 29, and no, we'll skip that. Okay, let's go to chapter 23. All right, verses 1. Do not bring a false report. Do not put under your hand, put your hand, excuse me, with the wrong to be a malicious witness. Do not follow a crowd to do evil, nor bear witness in a strife so as to turn aside after many, to turn aside from what is right. Do not favor a poor man in his strife. Okay, the big point here is do not follow the crowd. That's number one. And do not make judgment or make statements or do if it's to benefit you. Right? Don't be influenced by, oh, if I, this, if I do this, I'm going to get something out of it. You do it because it's right. 
You don't do it when it's wrong. You don't do it when it's wrong, but it benefits you because it's still wrong. Okay? And you don't do it when it pleases the crowd when you know it's still wrong. Do not follow the crowd. You, if the crowd is doing it right, then you're just doing it right and happen to be with the crowd. You understand? But you're not following the, we'll call it the peer or, or, or volume of the large crowd influence and just following it because you're being influenced, okay? Look, I'm, <laughs> of all people, you should know, look at me. I am not in any crowd, okay? And I don't do that on purpose. I just do what I do, which happens to not have a lot of crowd or a large crowd of people doing the same thing I'm doing. But, you know, there are people that have come to me over the years and said, well, you know, most of the people in the group don't like this, and most of the congregation, and I'm not going to make a decision because most of the people this and most of the people that. Okay? This is not a democracy. We're not voting. We, we don't have that structure here. You don't get a vote. Do you see anywhere where anybody gets a vote in the book? Do they take up a vote? <laughs> they take a few censuses where they count everybody. Okay? There's no voting. Now, we're told to take abundant counsel, and so it's important that those in leadership know how you feel, but, you know. I did have a lady, I've told that story many times. We were in a congregation, People were throwing the kids. It was a like gym like this, and the kids after service were throwing around balls and everything else, which we, which we didn't have the right to do in that place. We weren't renting it as a gym. We were renting it for our services. And I told the lady, no more ball play. After the ball basically almost hit a little baby in the face, and another time it almost knocked the guitar off its stand. I said, that's it. No more ball playing. And she said, well, I'm sure that everybody else, you know, nobody liked your decision. I said, I don't care what anybody, you know I'm not voting. We're not taking up a census and getting everybody's opinion. I get to make the decision, and I said, no. And of course, then she ranted for the rest of the day and whatever, okay? Look, if you have a problem with that structure, you're in the wrong place. The vertical structure above you has the right to make decisions without consulting you and making sure you're okay with it, okay? Now, it's wisdom to consult with you and to share with you the reasons and the thoughts Okay? That's wisdom. I think any man that doesn't talk about things with his wife before making decisions makes a mistake. However, I also think a lot of men don't talk to their wives about their decisions because their wives are going to tell them what an idiot they are and not respect the fact that they have the right to make the decision. So then why would we talk to you? See, I know you women all the time say, my husband doesn't tell me nothing. Well, how do you handle it when he does? Does he feel safe to talk to you? Or are you going to look at him like he's a moron making another dumb blah, blah, blah decision? Because I wouldn't talk to you if you treated me that way. i just make the decision. Because really, structurally, I don't need your permission. Okay? But that's not going to make for a real good relationship for us either way, right? If I'm not going to talk to you before I do something and you're not going to respect me when I tell you about what I want to do, well, we're going to have a real problem in our relationship. Right? It's got to have both of those things in it. Okay, but in the vertical structure, that decision burden is on the person above. Okay? That's a burden they have. Look, that's the way I always described it when I helped plant some congregations that are part of MQI. I said, look, when you start the congregation or as the thing grows, people need to know how decisions are made and who makes them. And the phrase I always use is that the person at the top has the burden of responsibility to make the decision. It's not like, I'm the boss, so I'm in charge. No, it's not I'm the boss, I'm in charge. I'm the highest responsible person, and that burden falls on me. Which means if it goes badly, it's on me. Okay? And actually, if it goes well, I don't even get the credit, because really I should be passing that up. up. So I get no credit, really, if it's good, but I get all the blame if it's bad. Like, Moses, your people who you brought out of Egypt, because <laughs> it was going bad, okay? But when it went well, praise Yah. <laughs> Not praise Moses, praise Yah, right? But as soon as things look bad, 
you know, your people are acting foolish down there, Moses. Your people. And Moses is like, my people? <laughs> I didn't bring them out of Egypt. But this is important that we get this, all right? It's very important that we get this. Don't follow the crowd. By the way, following the crowd also is be careful of who's influencing you, right? If you, and, and by the way, this is a much bigger problem for the ladies, especially because they tend to be more blue, okay? You, are, you tend to be highly influenced because of your total, you have a much higher sensitivity to embarrassment than say the guys do generally. Okay, guys do a lot of things through life that should embarrass anybody they could care less. They think it's funny and cool. Things that ladies you would never do. And so what I, the th what I want you not to do, though, is, this is a following the crowd thing. Three or four of your lady friends say, well, can you believe that? Or you shouldn't let your husband do that. Don't be influenced by all of that stuff. Okay? You know, because I've got people coming up to me on a regular basis in my life saying things like, well, you know, you know, such and such is going on. I go, well, I don't get it. They say, well, you know, all, my, all the other ladies are saying the same thing. Well, I don't care what they say either. And some of you are thinking, that's why we don't like this guy. He's just a pompous jerk. No. I'm not going to be influenced by the crowd. I'm going to gather what information I need and make a decision. And guess what? And this is for all you men and women, but men also, especially men, you need to know your decisions are not always going to be well received. Even if you're right. Sometimes especially if you're right. Because if they were so adamant about their things and it turned out you're right, you're really not going to get the, okay, you were right. But your decisions are still your decisions, okay? And some of you ladies are married to guys you need to be divorced from because they're making decisions. You need to let them make the decisions. You really don't like the decisions. Good. Stop trying to change and influence them. Just realize this is not the right place for you to be. And I'm not talking about divorce in a light way. I'm just saying, if you're not going to let him lead, why are you there? Because you trying to lead him is never going to work. As a matter of fact, if he lets you, you'll end up hating it. Okay, because you will not have a man. And I don't care what woke nonsense or whatever's out there. Ladies, you will not be happy unless you're married to a man. I'm not saying unless you're married. If you're single, that's fine. I'm saying if you're married and he's not being a man and you're not married to him, you will always be miserable. And usurping that's not going to fix it. So you either have to get behind encouraging him to become the man you need and supporting and doing whatever it is he needs for you to become that or you're going to need to go somewhere else. Okay? But belittling him and picking on him and bossing him and mothering him is never going to get it done. All I try to do is give you straight, right? Just trying to give it to you straight. All right? All right, so he says, don't follow the crowd. And then in verse 7, he says, keep yourself far from a false matter and do not kill the innocent and the righteous, for I do not declare the wrong right. You know, I play this game sometimes with people. I say, look, does Yahweh change? Or if they don't speak that way, I say, does God change? And they, most of the time they say, no, no, because they know the verse that says, you know, I am the Lord, I am Yahweh, I, do not, I change not, right? I don't change. Even Messiah, right? Same yesterday, today, and forever. So that being said, though, we, we must understand that if he declares something wrong, it will never, ever be right. It's still going to always be wrong to do. So you can't spin this in Christianity, you know, which, which you know, is incredible. That, I don't know. Look, all you Christians out there, I'm not picking on you. Your system is a disaster, okay? Because it tries to convince you that God is wrong and that he changed his mind and everything he said was wrong is now right and what he says right is now wrong and that's what you're being told. You're literally being told that. Don't spin it. Don't get mad at me. You're being told that you can eat anything you want, although there's a whole chapter in Leviticus telling you you can't eat all that stuff. So he said and declared it was wrong, but now your, your pastor told you you could eat it. So, hey, it's all good. Oh, but no, Messiah and Mark, no, Messiah didn't do that in Mark chapter 7, okay? That was added by other geniuses who wrote in, you know, and thus Jesus made all foods clean. 
No. First of all, the issue in Mark chapter 7, read the first couple of verses, is about eating bread without washing your hands. It's not about eating pork or eating bacon or eating shellfish. They were eating bread. Pay attention. <laughs> all right? But he says something's wrong. It will never be right. He just says it right here. He says, I do not declare the wrong right. But you want to believe that. You want to, you want to believe that that's all been done away with and changed. Wait, wait, wait. But what was being changed? What, can we give another phrase to the Torah? You know what the Torah is? His instruction on everything that's right and wrong. That's him declaring what's right and what's wrong. So you're saying his declaration of what's right and wrong has been done away with. See, you don't think of it that way. Now that might change your whole thinking. Because you're thinking, oh, these bunch of things I don't want to do have been done away with. Like now I can eat what I want. No, no. Everything he told you that was right and everything he told you that was wrong is what you're saying was done away with. His declaration of right behavior, right observances, right foods, right everything, you're saying is now the opposite. It's okay. You can do whatever you want. But you don't realize that's what you're doing when you're buying into this nonsense. Now, some of you are thinking, why do I talk like that? Don't you want Christians to come in? Look, it's, I'm not talking to the Christians. I'm talking about you not going back there. And I'm letting that any of you new ones who are hearing me, because any of you that are still Christian, you're going to just turn me off. Because you're not ready for this. Okay? When you're ready, it won't matter what I say. You'll be ready. But I don't want any of you to think about going back. Okay? Because you have to understand. I want you to cl clearly and plainly see he declares right and wrong. And then the church told you that doesn't matter anymore. That's literally what they said. Oh, no. They never said that God. No, they did by saying the Torah is done away with. Because the Torah is his declaration of right and wrong. Okay? Yes or no? Okay? So let's keep it straight and simple. This verse is straightforward. He says, keep yourself from a false matter. Don't get involved in anything that's false. Well, that means you're going to have to stop going to church and find a place like here because everything in there is false. Don't get mad at me. They're lying to you every Sunday. They are. They're not going to tell you the truth what's in here. And of course, they're going to say I'm a crazy cult leader and I'm, in, you know, I'm, a, I'm a false prophet and I'm a heretic. That's fine. Call me what you want. They called Yeshua that too. Okay? And all the apostles. You guys don't want the truth. He says, keep yourself far from a false matter and do not kill the innocent and the righteous for I do not declare the, the, the wrong right. He says, don't take a bribe because the bribe blinds. In other words, trying to make sure you don't get sucked in, right? We just talked about do not follow a crowd. Do not get involved with all these false things. Look, if you're going to take this seriously... How do you keep hanging out with all the people you know are immersed in a place you were that could drag you back in? Okay? Let me ask you a question. Some of you, I know probably none of you, right? Some of you, when you were younger, used to party. And if you're from the 80s or that range, you know what partying meant. <laughs> Nothing legal was happening. Okay? Lots of chemistry was going on in your body okay, that didn't belong in it. And then you became aware that that was wrong. Usually in line when you first realized the vertical was there and everything else. And you also realized you shouldn't keep hanging out with your friends that were doing all of that wild, worldly, fleshly stuff. Because if you did, you would get caught up in, the, in it. See, remember, Yeshua's prayer was that we not be taken out of the world, but that we are not in and of it. Like, we're not participating in it. We have to live here. But I can live here and not necessarily hang out with you while you're doing all that crazy stuff that we all used to do. And your friends call you up, come on, we're going to the bars. And you're like, no, that's okay. Some of you probably still went anyway at the beginning and realized, oh, how easy it was to get caught back up in it when you were first coming out. And you realized you couldn't do both. But you tried, because you thought, well, I know better, but I'm going to just, I'll behave. You can't. He says, don't get caught up in that stuff, because 
You need to stay far from false things. And so what's going to be false things? So you're listening to a teacher, and you know they say something that's wrong, but you generally like the teacher, so you're going to keep listening to them anyway. How many wrong things do they have to say for you to stop listening? Okay? I mean, how many wrong things do they have to say for you to stop listening? I got something in the mail. <laughs> yes, believe it or not, people send me stuff in the mail to straighten me out and everything else to do whatever they are doing. Okay? This one was sent probably just to everybody in ministry anywhere. It wasn't to me specifically. It was just somebody who thinks he's supposed to be teaching all the teachers. All right? And it talked about this, that, and the other thing, some of which was probably not wrong. Okay? There's, there were some basic things like, I think, the Sabbath or whatever. But then it got all the way, it was mostly into this gematria thing where it was taking all these numbers, like the Bible code stuff. And it was like 27 things on one page, line after line, about Jesus is this, Jesus is that, all showing from the numbers. And I, my answer was, Jesus, you got it all wrong. Because we know that's not his name. We know what the name's being used for. So if you're making your argument using that name, you're already, the thing went right in the garbage. Okay? How much wrong has to be in there? Okay? Now, by wrong, I mean not something you don't like or you're not sure or whatever the first time you hear it because you disagree. I mean, stuff that you know is wrong. Stuff that you came out of, in other words. Okay? Not stuff you know is wrong because it's the way you believed it before, and now when you hear it, it doesn't match because maybe you're wrong. You understand what I'm saying? But stuff that you've already come out of and you already know and have established is wrong. How much of that mainstream sort of rhetoric and, and stuff do you need to hear to recognize that you shouldn't be listening to that guy anymore? Or woman, whoever it is that you're listening to. But you're not going to stay far from the fault. But I like that person. You have no idea how important they were on my journey. Good. They got you this far. You don't need them anymore. And so some of you out there get all like, see, I know what he wants is get everybody to himself. Well, apparently I'm doing a bad job about it because I watch all these other guys out there with 190 and 300,000 followers, and I've got 40,000. So apparently that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to reach the ones that need to hear this. Okay? Because it's, it, 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 Elder and I look at some of these people, and I won't mention, but I spoke to one this week, he's got his own ministry out there, I'm not sure how good or bad it is or, yet at this point, but the thing is, he's got like 200,000 subs, and I've got 40,000 subs. It is what it is, okay? I didn't realize this guy was that popular, all right? But that's the thing is, you guys have to understand, I'm not trying to gather anything. I'm trying to warn you, as it says here, you're to stay, I'm not telling you who's false. You gotta figure that out. And knock it off once you recognize something is false. I mean, I got all these people telling me, well, you know, my spouse still wants me to go to Sunday church with them. How can you do that? How can you walk in there and sit and listen to what you know you're going to hear? There is no way. I'd have to get up and leave if I even went in the first place. Look, I've walked out of a good number of Messianic congregations after the leader at the front started spewing some mainstream nonsense on Saturday. And I said, that's it. I'm done. Okay? I said, I'm, look, and as a, as a man, I told my wife, I said, look, if you want to still come to this place, you know, because we didn't have any else place to go at the time, I said, that's okay, I'm allowed that. I can't do this. Because it wasn't terrible all the time, but it was, I, I have a very low threshold for that. Okay? And to her credit, she did too, and she's like, no, I can't do this either. All right? Because I know we had the little children at the time, and we had a place to go. But see, that's the, that's the trap. A lot of people say, well, I need to go for the kids. And, you know, stop that. The kids are going to grow into whatever they're going to grow into regardless. Okay? I'm not saying it doesn't matter what you do, and I'm not trying to contradict the verse that says raise up a child in the way it should go, etc. But I'm saying in modern times, not those times when people were tribally raising their children, in modern times, do the best you can, probably won't make any difference. They're going to go on their own journey. Abba's got to pop their own bubbles. It is what it is. The most important thing for you is that you walk this in a way that they get to watch you. Set a good example. Stop trying to control them, okay? All it's going to do is frustrate you anyway. All right? I got two children, very different. 
And I can promise you, I tried to control neither of them. And the way they grew up and ended up is the way they grew up and ended up. All right? So when you see my daughter, how amazing she is, I take very little credit for that directly. That's her and him. All right? And my son isn't quite in the same place as that. I take no blame or credit for that either, between him and him. Okay? It is what it is. And I'm hopeful at all times that all of our children at some point will all be on the same bubble popped, you know, vertically structured, covenanted place. But I deal with a lot of you that are very upset with your children that are not there. I get it, okay? I don't want you thinking, oh, well, Rabbi, you don't know because both your children know. I got one of each, and that's Abba did that so that I'd know, okay? And I love them both very dearly. And I'm very close to both of them, okay? But I also know the world that each of them walks in, and we're influenced by the world we walk in, okay? And who we hang out with. I don't know the statistics, but there's a thing that all the motivational development guys say that you are the sum total of, you know, the five or ten people that you spend most of your time with, okay? You're the average of that. You hang, yourself, you hang out with people that are in the muck, guess where you're going to end up being? In the muck, all right? Hang out with people that are moving up, you're going to end up moving up. Because we are influenced. And stop thinking you're the one trying to influence all of them. It doesn't usually work that way. Remember, it doesn't say one good apple makes the bad batch good. There's no saying like that. One bad apple spoils a whole bunch, girl. That's Donnie Osmond from the 70s. Okay, never mind. Most of you have no idea. Okay? Okay. <laughs> Do you, anybody actually know that song? Wow, look at how many hands know that song. Fantastic. It was a big hit from the guy with the purple socks. Okay, so that was a big thing with Donnie Osmond. All right. Sing One Bad Apple? No. Do you know how high his voice was in that song? It was higher than a girl's voice. It was like he's shrieking. Up. I can't do that. You know, he's, he was a young teenager singing. He was like probably 16, 17 years old he was singing that song. Anyway, um, but you need to know if you're hanging out with people, if you're the good apple, you're not fixing the bad bunch. You're going to be influenced by the, the other way around. It's, it's just the way it works, all right? So don't get caught up in all that. All right, next, verse, we're in chapter 23. We're going to go to verse, let's see, 13, all right? And all that I have said to you, take heed and make no mention of the name of other mighty ones, let it not be heard from your mouth. Okay, so let me, <laughs> let me make sure we understand what he's talking about here. We're not superstitious about incantations because you said the name of a God, all right? He's saying it should not be heard reverentially out of your mouth. You're not declaring their name. You're not praying to that name. You're not calling upon that name. That's what he's talking about. So when you're reading, and in your reading you read Kemosh, or you read Baal. <gasps> no, you can pronounce those names. You're reading them as part of your reading, okay? But he's talking about those names should not be coming out of your mouth like you would call on Yahweh. You are not to use those names in that way. All right? Calling upon. So it shouldn't be heard out of your mouth in that form. Of course, if you're reading the verse, the names are there, yes. Or if you're referring to, by the way, those are the people that worship that God, that's fine. You're naming, the, it's just information. But when you start saying, oh, mighty, whatever, and you start, then that's a whole different problem. Okay? When you start treating that, whatever that false God name, whatever thing is, like you would treat him, and use the names like you would use his name, now you're in trouble. Okay? Let's be clear on that. All right. Um, you know, it's really funny because <laughs> I never said this before, but listen to this. <coughs> Excuse me. So make no mention of the names of the mighty ones. So we take this from a Jewish point of view and don't make any mention of the actual mighty one. How does that make sense? Okay, say it again. So, 
Here it says to not make any mention of these false mighty ones, yet the Jewish perspective is to not make mention of the actual mighty one. Because we call the actual mighty one Hashem, which means in Hebrew the name. Or we say Adonai, which is master. We don't want to say the name. Even, well, but, but you're such a silly rabbi, you don't understand. The third commandment tells you you can't say his name. The third commandment says no such thing. The third commandment doesn't say words like this. You are not to have it come out of your mouth. It says you're not to take the name and make it of no use, of nothing, to, to make it into nothing, to make it vain. When, when, when Solomon is talking about vanity, he says it's like the air, like the wind, it's, it's nothing. Vapor, right? So the name Yahweh, if you make it into just like nothing, like just a bunch of hot air, so to speak, like just nothingness, he says that's the third commandment. Don't take his name on you and then make it into something it's not and bring it shame and just, you know, make it of no value. But he says here very specifically, don't you mention these names in any authoritative way. So when we're using authoritative, you know, using his name with authority, I'm sorry, my Jewish brothers, I think you're making a mistake. I think you don't understand. Now, I will go with one thing. I think we use it too lightly. Okay, we take the name way too lightly. But I think we shouldn't be avoiding it completely. Okay, so if you ever notice with me, I will say almighty, I will say creator. I will use all other ways of referring to and not actually say Yahweh as much as maybe some of you do because I only want to be careful that I'm using the right level of reverence with his name, okay? I'll read when it says his name, but you'll notice I don't use his name a whole lot necessarily, okay? Because I want to be very reverent with the authority of that name. But I will use his name, even if we really don't know 100% how to pronounce it. I will use it the best I can. All right. Um... Let's see, chapter 23, verse 15, guard the festival of unleavened bread. Seven days you eat unleavened bread as I have commanded you. By the way, somebody asked a question recently about do we have to eat unleavened bread for seven days? Uh, it just said that right there. <laughs> and it says it in other instructions about the, you know, in Exodus 12 and 13. There's other places where it talks about it. But yes, you are to eat unleavened bread for the seven days. All right. Um... He says, at the time appointed in the month of Aviv, for in it you came out of Mitzrayim and do not appear before me empty-handed. All right, so first of all, let's understand, and I know we say this a lot, but I know not everybody gets to hear every Torah portion that I do. The month of Aviv is the Hebrew for spring, okay? It's saying you do this in the spring. It's not because they went out and looked for green ears of barley, I know that that's what Michael Rood and all these other, you know, Hemia Gordon and all these guys get obsessed with. That's not scriptural, okay? There was nothing green when they left. He says, because it was in the month of Aviv that you left Egypt. The hail and the locusts ate everything and destroyed everything. There wasn't anything Aviv. It literally tells you that. It says there wasn't anything left Aviv. It was destroyed because it was Aviv. Everything that was Aviv was destroyed or eaten. But it's saying that this takes place in the spring, okay? And then, of course, we start naming months, and we name the first one, the one that Passover's in, Aviv. Because <laughs> that's the month where the Passover is, okay? So, he says, guard the festival of bread, but you're to guard these things. Make sure you keep them. Just understand there's no instruction here to go out and check the status of the barley, okay? Now, the barley has to be ripe enough to do Shavuot. That's in... Leviticus 23, it explains all that. So it has to be ripe enough that the first, the first ears, the first ripe barley is brought for a wave sheaf. Okay, be Kareem. You need to do the wave sheaf. But yet, you know, just don't confuse this verse, okay? It says the month of Aviv. It's saying this basically was in the spring. All right. Verse 19. Now we have this in verse 19, and we have this in chapter 34, 26, and in 14, 21 of Deuteronomy. Three times it says this, do not cook a kid in its mother's milk, a young goat in its mother's milk. Okay? Now, our brothers in the Jewish community, um, 
Oh, by the way, Elder, when you're doing announcements or prayer time or anything, you say, you said something, you say, oh, I got that from Judah. They're going to think you got it from your Jewish brothers. They don't understand your son's name is Judah. So, <laughs> You called her Miss Rebetzin Joanne or something. You said, oh, I got that from Judah. Uh, the Jewish community doesn't call her Miss Rebetzin Joanne. Joanne, okay. <laughs> I caught it. I'm thinking not everybody's going to know what you said. All right. But our Jewish brothers... Take the fact that these verses are meant, the same thing is mentioned three times in very interestingly random places. They seem random places. Like there's a bunch of laws and then this one's thrown in there. And then another bunch of laws and this one's thrown in. So it's in three different places. And they'll take that to mean that you cannot have a cheeseburger or you cannot have dairy products and meat products at the same meal. All right? Well, let's take the Peshat. All right? Don't cook a young goat in its mother's milk. That means, um, I don't know, don't cook a young goat in its mother's milk, <laughs> okay? And so, there are no young goats, hopefully, in your cheeseburger, all right? They don't use goat meat usually for that. And you're not cooking it in the milk. Now, they'll say that this is, you know, this, this kashrut law of separation of, of the milk and the meat. Look, in Genesis, okay, Okay, in Genesis chapter, let's see, 18, I believe. All right. All right, chapter 18 of Genesis, Yahweh appears to Abraham in verse 1. Who? Yahweh. Like, like not just like an angel, didn't say like a messenger. Yahweh appears to Abraham. And Abraham recognizes him. And in verse 3 says, Yahweh, if I found any favor in your eyes, please don't pass your servant by. Come, come on in. Let me wash your feet. Let me get you some food. And he tells his wife to go hurry and get some things prepared. And he gets a young calf and they cook it and all these other things. And he says, okay, look at verse 8. He took the curds, which is like the cheese, right? The curds, the milk, and the calf which he had prepared and set it before them and stood by while they ate it. The meat and the milk. And now the Jews might say, oh no, no, they ate the curds and the milk first and they waited an hour or whatever it is that they claim you need to wait, then they ate the meat. Well, it doesn't say any of that, okay? Oh, oh, well, you know, this is before Exodus and this is before Mount Sinai. Yahweh doesn't change. He told Noah to be careful how many of the clean and unclean animals so he already knew what clean and unclean animals were in chapter 6, okay? So this happened earlier on with Noah. He knew what was what, 6 and 7, right, somewhere in that range. And so let's not play those spins. Now, it may not be the best for your digestion to put dairy and meat in your system at the same time. It might curdle in your system. It might, you may have some problems. And so there may be some wisdom in all that, but I'm just saying is that Cooking a kid in his mother's milk doesn't necessarily have anything to do with you can't have meat and dairy together, okay? I think he would have said it a lot clearer if that were the case, okay? Now, I personally don't eat those things, well, at least not cheeseburgers. You know why? I don't like them. Okay, so people will watch me sometimes and people are getting cheeseburgers and I'm not, and they're like, oh, Rabbi doesn't get a cheeseburger. I don't like cheeseburgers. I just don't like cheese on my burger. That's me, okay? I'm not a big cheese guy to begin with. But I'm just saying is, let's be careful that we're not flying to the other side of the riverbank, so to speak, to the Jewish side and getting into all of their stuff, all right? This verse, I believe, was that there was a ritual that was going on in those days where literally the pagans were, as a fertility, fertility thing, were cooking a young goat in the mother's milk as part of what they did. And he said, don't you do that. Because lots of verses talk about do not do as they do to their gods. As a matter of fact, I have a teaching called do not do as they do. It's one part. It's about 100 years old, but you can find it. It's out there, okay? It's, a, it's an old teaching, all right? You know it's old when it's only one part. <laughs> That's to tell you right there. Because I can't remember the last time I did something that, that was one part. All right, so back to Exodus, all right? Let's get to back to chapter 23, okay? And we're going to look at verse 20. 
See, I am sending a messenger before you to guard you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Be on guard before him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he is not going to pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. But you are to diligently obey his voice and shall do all that I speak. Then I shall be an enemy to, uh, if you do all these things, then I shall be an enemy to your enemies and a distresser to those who distress you. For my messenger shall go before you and shall bring you into the Amorites and the Hittites, etc. Look. See, I am sending a messenger before you to guard the way. So, look, you could take this on a high level of thinking there was an angel of some sort, maybe Yeshua, whatever, was sent before them. But I, I'm thinking it's more talking about Moses and then Joshua. Why? Because he says, you diligently obey his voice. He says, you're not going to rebel against him, for he is not going to pardon your transgressions. Well, who was told to do the judging? Moses was in that structure. He says, and you shall do all that I speak. Well, where do the words of Yahweh come? Out of the mouth of who? Do you see an angel speaking them? We see Moses speaking them. You understand what I'm saying? The voice, again, is what we're talking about. So look, this is the purpose of an anointed messenger to guard you in the way and bring you into the place which he has prepared for you. A, an anointed person with Yah's message. Whoever that may be. I'll call that in Ephesians 4.11, anointed, appointed, teacher, prophet, apostle, like someone uh, the, to lead you and plant a congregation. Their job is to guard you in the way and bring you into the place which he, Yahweh, has prepared for you. Look, verse 21, he says, my name is in him. And verse 22 says, obey me through him. Okay? You're going to obey me through him. But if you diligently obey his voice and do not do, and shall do all that I speak. So you got to obey me through him. And when he says, oh, he's not going to pardon your transgression. We just had two chapters of legalese about transgressions and how they shouldn't be pardoned, how they should be handled. And who's making those judgments? The court system headed by Moses. Now, we don't have it explained quite that way, although we did with Yitro. Yitro explained, let the hardest matters be brought to you. And then, of course, when we get to Deuteronomy 17, you'll see it all play out. So let's be more clear about these things. I think we really don't have a big enough, and I talked about this a lot last week. I'm not going to get into it totally again. You need to go away. Maybe we listen to it when we post it next week as a teaching. This understanding of your role in finding the person or people in that role. And then when you find those people or that person that you understand that their job is to guard you in a way and bring you into the place that he prepared for you, you need to then be submitting to knowing that they will not pardon your transgression. See, you still, for the last 2,000 years, you wanted to think a teacher's a teacher, anybody's a teacher, they go to seminary, they get a degree, they, anybody can teach. Matter of fact, nowadays nobody needs to do all of that. Just get a microphone and a video camera and go on YouTube. Everybody's a teacher. But what about these guys that are actually speaking because his name is in them and you need to obey through them? Is, is that a real thing? Or am I just saying it because it benefits me in some way? Is it a real thing? Well, if it's a real thing, then you need to find those people. If it's a real, and if it's a real thing, you find those people, you have to be okay not liking them. You have to be okay if they're not your cup of tea or you don't like their approach. Because you can't tell me right now that every one of you with all your different personalities would love Moses as the leader and his style. Or you can't tell me you would have loved Yeshua. Don't tell me you would have loved the way he handled. He, he hung out with people you might not have liked and he did other things. He had an anger and a temper at times when he was flipping over tables. I mean, and he just let people get away and walk all over him at times, and you would have been like, why are you letting him do that? You'd have something to say. I could pick any of the other people you could pick. Pick Paul, pick anybody. Pick Peter, pick James. There's going to be stuff that you look at them going, I would not have loved the way they handled that. Well, that's going to be the case with everybody, because none of them, you ready for this? Nobody else is you but you. And mostly, you don't even like you, so what does that even help? <laughs> Would you follow you? Okay. 
But what you're looking for is my name being in that person. They're speaking my words with my authority. I'm speaking to you through them. If you diligently obey my voice that I speak through that messenger. Look, you can't tell me this is the cloud and the fire. Those things are not making any noise. There's no verses saying that there's talking coming out of the cloud or the fire. None. Oh, yeah, we say that we heard a voice out of the thundering in the cloud. That was Mount Sinai. The pillar, I'm saying, the one that went before them, the pillar isn't speaking. Moses is speaking. And then we're going to see the 70. The elders that he ends up appointing. We see that at the end here. Where Nadu and Abu, uh, Nadab and Abu and the 70 elders go up. So they do some speaking. Oh, all right. So then we get to, look at this, I'm going to take up the whole time anyway. All right. <laughs> Blame him. He's just putting the words in my mouth. All right. Uh, chapter 23 and verse 28. Okay. And I shall send hornets before you, which shall drive out the, the, the Hivites and the Canaanites and the Hittites from before you. I shall not drive them out before you in one year, lest the land become a waste and the beasts of the field become too numerous. Little by little, I'm going to drive them out until you have increased enough to inherit the land. Okay. This is literal, and then we can take it to other levels. Literally, if we lived in that world, if you chased people out, wild beasts came in. Okay? Now, most of us live in cities where you don't see wild beasts running around. Okay? You can go to some of the really more, you know, uh, I don't know, older places where they don't have the big cities, like out in, 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 you know, in parts of, again, South America and Central America and India and Africa and other places, you know, middle of Australia, places where they're just like they always were, you know, where there's not the big civilization. There's lots of wild animals living. And if you take any of the the larger animals out, you get a big growth of other things. You take some of the, whatever you do to affect the, the ecosystem, there's an effect. So you can't just take all the people out quickly without being overrun by the beasts. Okay? So what, let's take this into a deeper level for your life. Be patient at the pace that is good for you to clean out all the house that you need to clean out, lest other junk come running in because you left an empty space that's a, you know, vacuums get filled. You can't create a vacuum that won't get filled, okay? So when you create an empty space, it's gonna get filled. So you need to be, at whatever speed you handle it, as you're clearing out, you're replacing. So some of you do that very slowly, some of you do it very quickly. As long as you're doing that process, it doesn't matter the speed, okay? You can't just clear everything out and be doing, and now you got this big empty space that who knows what's going to jump in there. Does it make sense? Okay? So I, I warn people all the time. I said, look, I know you're excited, but if you're going to listen to every teaching you can, four or five a day, some of you can do that. Some of you, it's going to bust you and you're going to pop and just it's not going to work because you can't handle that much. Not everybody can handle that much change that quickly. Finding out that so much of what you've always known has just been upside down, backwards, and wrong. You, now, some of you handle it fine, so I'm not saying you can't do it, but you got to know you. What can you handle, okay? And go at a pace, because I know the, the temptation is you feel like you're so far behind, you need to catch up because, oh my gosh, I have everything wrong. I'm already 45 years old. What am I going to do? Okay, take it slower. Do it at the speed that is your speed. Maybe at some point you can accelerate as you get you know, kind of used to it and stuff. All right? Because I knew a person, I warned, and you know what? Three months later, she was gone because she just, it was the parable of the sower. She didn't have the roots, and then somebody she talked to because she got excited about what was going on went, huffed and puffed and blew her right out. Okay? Because the outside influence of other people is going to try to fill that void. So you have to be emptying and filling at the same time, at whatever that speed is. Both at the same speed. You can't be doing this and then slowly. Okay? Both, okay, together, same speed. 
So he gives us a picture of that here. All right. Uh, chapter 24, we have something very odd in verse 3 and in verse 7. It says, And Moshe came and related to the people all the words of Yahweh, and the, all the people answered and said, All the words which Yahweh said we will do. I think that's pretty odd. And then in verse 7, he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people, and then he said, All that Yahweh has spoken we shall do and obey. Now, of course, this is where the blood is sprinkled on them, okay? And so we have this happening. Now, Moses then takes the blood and sprinkles it on the people, right? We're going to talk about the blood and covenant, life, etc., being sprinkled. Now, now, as we are then looking at verse, the last one we're going to cover tonight, really, is verse 9, okay, 24. Verse 9 says, Moses went up, also Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and the 70 of the elders. Okay? And so they starts, this starts to become a clarity of differentiation of who has what roles. Okay? These 70 are now being separated in some way. And we're going to find those 70 eventually have the anointing that's on Moses get put on the 70. And so you'll see the anointing of others. Okay? Um... In my notes, I wrote justice and equity. I said, you are responsible for what you do, what, is, what, what belongs to you does, and what you have borrowed, and what you know. That was part of the main point of the earlier parts of the chapter, right? You're responsible for what you do, what is yours does, and what you have borrowed, and what you know. It seems pretty basic and simple. As a matter of fact, that's probably what you would teach your kid when he's four. Okay, you're responsible with your stuff and your due and when you borrow something and you take care of it and give it back to the person in good condition, etc. right? Okay? Which is funny because in my life that almost never happens. So if I lend something to somebody, I don't expect it to come back. And if it does, I expect to pretty much want to just throw it out because it's been treated badly. I've lent people books that I think they used as napkins. It's like they're eating and drinking all over. I'm like, what would, why didn't somebody borrow something you treat it so badly, you know? I like almost have to squeeze the food out of it when they give it back to me. It's really gross, you know. I'm like, good, no, that's okay, you keep it. <laughs> I don't want it back. All right, if there's any comments or questions, we'll take a few now. It's almost 10 o'clock. Hopefully that was helpful, all right? Ooh, I got some exciting news I didn't get to mention. Starting next week, Rebitson will be up here because we're going to start talking about temple-related things and offerings. And so she's going to be up here for a couple of weeks teaching about the temple and the offerings and having all the great slideshows that she has with all new artwork and stuff by, by Vera, et cetera. So we're going to have some great, great stuff. So hopefully you get excited about that. All right. And for all you men having a meltdown because I'm going to have my wife up here teaching, well, get over it. Okay? That's right. She was anointed by me to do something I know she knows and studies and teaches very, very well. Okay? All right. Janet. Thank you, Rabbi, for a wonderful Torah study. You're welcome. Rabbi, um, chapter 23rd, and I don't think you covered, well, maybe you did a little bit, um, verse 19. Actually, it's verse 16 and verse 19. You know, it's, it talks about a festival of the harvest, the first fruits of your labors which you have sown, right? Um, and a festival of the ingathering, which I think is Sukkot, right? At the outgoing of the year when you have gathered in the fruit of your labors from the field. Right. So we, we celebrate the three festivals and we bring our offerings. Right. But the first fruits, is that something that doesn't apply, right? I mean, how, can you help right. me understand that? Okay, so don't, don't worry about what it says here in Exodus. I'm not being disrespectful to Exodus. He's going to clarify. Remember, he's only mentioned small pieces of the Torah along the way. Okay. So here all of a sudden he's dropping these little nuggets about feasts when later he's going to give us the whole chapter explaining all this, right? So... We will wait till Leviticus 23 to get the full message. Okay? okay? okay. It's just like he didn't give everything about kashrut when he mentioned to Noah about clean and unclean animals. He didn't talk about chewing the cud and split hoof. He didn't talk about fins and scales. He didn't talk about any of the details. He just mentioned clean and unclean. Mm -hmm. 
So here he's not giving us a lot of the detail about these festivals. He just mentions them, and then we'll get the full details further on, okay? All right, next. So it's related to something that you were saying before about how we as wife should be not mocking or whatever, you know, we can do sometimes with our husbands, right? No. So, I, I, <laughs> so shocking. Question. We were doing the uh, blessings, and it came out as a joke, and I actually asked for it, but saying, right, the couple here is sweet. In, in a honeymoon, we were calling each other king and queen. And so I was asking Rosie, should we call our husbands kings? And she said, ah, maybe you can call him Lord. <laughs> so I wanted to ask your feedback. Look, on it, that. it doesn't matter the metaphor that works for you, just as long as you understand the vertical structure that you're trying to put there. You know, it talks about Sarah being very happy to call Abraham master, okay? which wasn't necessarily calling him the title, but having the mindset of where he was vertically to her, okay? So, um, and please, the harder part in some way, well, I guess it's just as hard in both ways, but the, the hard, part for the guy, hard part for the guys, okay, is that you have to just not get, you know, bloated in your ego if, if someone's calling you some higher level. Just understand it's a higher level of responsibility in serving, okay? So if she's calling you king or lord or master or whatever you know, way to try to be respectful, realize you need to then, out of that respect that you're receiving, you know, pour out on that person all of the things that your authority should bring them, right? Okay, they're not there to build you up as the authority. You're there to take care of, provide, and to give, right? In the vertical structure, all vessels, people, lower than you, or lower than whoever, you know, whatever level, are receptacles. You're meant to be receivers from above. Yahweh created all of us to receive from him. But then he gave us opportunities to then also be givers to others, within the structure, so we have to learn to receive and to provide. So the more your wife, men, treats you with respect as above, then you need to be more focused on providing to her, because that's the reason you have the position. You don't have the position so you can just do whatever you want and you're in charge, no. You have it because you have a burden of responsibility, okay? Which is why I know this is hard for some of you men, you don't like when I mention it. But I, when my wife asks me if I want to do something, whatever, it's like TV, or I, I say, you can do what you want. I always ask her to provide because I don't want to put me first unless it's important for providing and protecting. So if we have that one TV we, you, we both use in the living room, well then, if she's home and I'm home, I'll ask her, do you want to use the TV? She will say, well, do you? I said, I don't care, you can use it. Okay, there's rare times when I know something's happening in the world, they may want to watch the news for a few minutes just to make sure I know what's going on, and then I'll give it to her. I'm not gonna watch five hours of it, because usually whatever is happening in the world, you find out in 10 minutes, and they just repeat it 57 times, all right? So I watch the 10 minutes, find out what's going on, but guys, I don't use my authority to please, you ready for this? To please me. <laughs> I don't use my authority to please me. I use my authority to please others. I use my authority to provide and protect others, to put others above myself, in terms of not above me vertically, but above me in terms of making sure they're taken care of before I'm taken care of, okay? Some of you guys think your authority is about making sure you get what you want. No, your authority is to make sure that everybody else gets what they need and some of what they want, all right? And so, it's my good pleasure to let my wife watch whatever she wants, unless there's a need for me to have the TV, okay? I just have learned not to put my wants in front of her. And then she learns to really respect and appreciate that I provide that covering and place where she can do whatever she, and enjoy life, etc. because that makes me happy. Because happy wife, happy life is a true thing, all right? 
All right, but ladies, you're really not going to be happy if you don't actually support and encourage and recognize the vertical for your husband as well. All right, uh, Jenna. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you for all the clarification in your teaching. Um, I'm glad that we're talking about a happy wife and happy life and the roles of men and women because it seems to me that when you were saying that the, the second wife was invited by the first wife, okay, and we're talking about modern conveniences and televisions and washing machines and, you know, that and this, um, you know, would it be appropriate to, you know, put in my mind that it was a cooperative thing, like, there was a lot of work going on, you know, they had to gather wood to cook, they had to grow a lot of their own things, they had to sew their own things, they had to, you know, I mean, that's a lot of work for the role of a, of a woman during that time period, I'm sure that it was exhausting, and so maybe they wanted at that time, they didn't have, you know, a microwave. Oh, look, <laughs> you know? look, I can agree with you that, mm -hmm. and guys, don't, don't read more into this. I can agree that from a functional point of view, mm -hmm. I can see where it would be helpful mm -hmm. to have additional wives, not for the man, but for the wife. That's what I would okay? like, yeah. Even today I could see that because this world has gotten just as challenging with women working and men working and then children and all the other things. I got a lot of ladies out there want to homeschool their kids but can't because they have to work too. Well, what if one wife was out there doing, like back in those days, helping with the crops, and the other wife was helping with the children, another one was doing the housework. Or they, they were able to share all of the tasks. And then the husband didn't need another husband. He'd have all the boys, all the sons, out there doing the work with him, right? And so, I mean, I can see this from a functional point of view mm -hmm. being of value possibly to people even today. It's mindset-wise, most women can't go there, and I wouldn't... That, that's what I suggest that you do. I'm just saying is if you were looking at it from that point of view. Now, they were living in a community, a tribal community, right? There was a, a families, multiple families together in a community, which meant that some of the ladies were doing the, the, this, whatever, cleaning tasks or the cooking tasks or the gathering tasks, and others were doing the baby nursing tasks and the baby raising tasks and the baby instructing tasks. So they were able to have one person can handle three or four at a time or whatever because they could split up the, the workload. But when i trying to talk on the phone, this happened this week a few times, to somebody, and the lady on the phone is trying to get counsel, and she's got a toddler and an infant screaming or wanting and Because you know it doesn't happen until you pick up the phone. Those kids have not even said a word, and all of a sudden you get the phone and all whatever breaks loose, right? And all of a sudden they need your attention, and it's like, mama, mama. But you'd have somebody else to watch them. I get that, okay? And then, look, what if one of you went to the store and another one got to do whatever, all right? Look, there's, it, there's a lot that could be said for that, okay? But we also have things like sex that are involved and we don't necessarily want to share our husbands with other people and all these other things. So there's other issues that do come up, okay? Although there are some of you ladies that don't want to do it that all that often, so maybe it'd be nice to have somebody else do it when you don't want to. So take, take that little jab, all right? Okay? Because why should he suffer just because you don't want to? Because <laughs> he's going to want to until they put him in the box. Okay? I mean, that's just kind of the way it is. Most of the time. There's some, some, some exceptions to that. No, but I'm seriously, this is not the same world. But I appreciate you coming up and bringing out some of those understandings. All right? Look, you know what, there's, there's other issues that could come up as well. What if you're a Torah observant, you're 25 years old, and you recognize that from a Torah observant point of view, you finding someone is going to be a little tough. Or maybe you're 35 years old or 45 years old. So, but you still want to have that relationship. You still want to be covered. If you're young enough, you still want to have children, but you don't want to just do that with anybody. It's, it's a tough situation. You know, we're, you're, we're all fish in a very small pond. Okay? Now, of course, we have an Almighty that can make anything happen. So that's why you have to have Emunah, you have to have your trust, because He can make anything happen. All right? I mean, He kept me single for 35 years, sent me to Florida to do something with commodity trading. Who knew I was going to end up going to one congregation that had one single woman, and that would be my wife? Who also happened to be single and the right. I mean, everything was just. But I didn't think at that point I was ever going to find her. She was so convinced she wasn't going to find anybody. She was going to adopt a child and just be single the rest of her life. 
and then I ruined that whole plan. <laughs> you know, that literally was her plan right before meeting me, okay? But yet, he can provide, okay? He can provide. All right, so anyway, next, we're up to live stream. Okay, from Ron Bow says, Shabbat Shalom, Rabbi. Concerning the goat and the milk, could it be that Abba was saying to avoid cooking a young goat until it was weaned from its mother? Uh, certainly. That's certainly a possibility. Um, you know, so maybe talking about the timing. All right. So no veal for everybody. Okay. So that wouldn't be a goat, but it'd be a cow, but she'll be young. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next. Okay, Lisa Hersey has, she shotgunned a few on, in one sentence here. It says, what were the hornets sent out, Exodus 23, 8, and were the slaves and servants the same thing, and could female servants be freed at will by the master, Exodus 21, 4 through 10? Okay, hold on. Exodus, let me just get them one at a time here. So Exodus 23, 8. What are the hornets sent out? Okay, I think you got the wrong verse there. Okay. Um, the hornets was 28. Okay, so 20, Exodus 23, 28. Um, it's, not, it's not so much the hornets. He's just saying I'm going to chase, if I chase the people out in whatever way I do. He's giving them pictures and metaphors. He's not being literal here. Okay? Well, he certainly could. He sent locusts to eat all of the stuff in, in Egypt. But his point was, I'm not going to get rid of all these people and one sh all just, sh just kick them all out because they can create a bigger problem than you'd have, you'd have had before. It'd just be a different problem. All right? Then he says, were the slaves and the servants the same thing? And could female servants be freed at will? Okay, 21, 4 through 10. All right, so my answer to this is it doesn't matter. And the reason it doesn't matter is because we are not doing slavery. We're not living in that world, and we don't need to understand all the details of the rules of slavery. Okay, because I think at this point, we all realize in this world that we're in that this is not something we need to be doing. All right, so I'm not going to sit here and try to figure out what their rules were in that world. We just need to know that that was the rules that we was giving them in that world to those people. Okay? So these, look, there's some things in Torah that just don't apply to you because we don't have that happening, okay? So these things don't apply to you. Not that the Torah is done away, it just doesn't apply. We don't do slavery anymore in any form. And certainly, this is only talking to them as a nation going into the land, how they would handle it, right? And we're certainly not that, okay? So I'm not going to try to guess and figure out all of that. As far as the female servants being freed at will by the master, I don't think the female servants would ever have been freed for any reason. Okay, if a man wanted to stay with the female servant, we have those rules. Okay, remember, women were not thought of the same way men were thought of today. Okay, that's not, they were not thought of. You were always been and always will be of equal value. But back then, men were looked at very differently than a woman. A woman was always a part of a man. If you were a female slave, you belonged to that man. Okay, if he gave a man to you as a husband, then you belong to that man only to the point where if he wants to free that man, then the man would have to stay to have you because then you still belong to the, the owner, okay? All right. I mean, I, look, I don't even like talking about this stuff because I think we all feel the same way, hopefully, that this is something that on a lot of levels would be very repugnant to us. But it is there, and so I can't... I, it's, it is there. <laughs> I can't ignore the things that are there. All right. Rob? From Deirdre Kosdorf. It says... I'll have been at MTY seven years after Pesach, and I've been thinking about getting a second piercing because I love the symbolism and want to stay with the master. Is this okay? Okay. So, and she says she's home recovering and being sick. Okay. Well, feel better, first of all. I hope you recover and, and quickly. Um, but don't come back until you're better. I don't... No, I don't mean it in that way. I just, a lot of people do rush too quickly, and then they end up relapsing. Forget about if they even get anybody else sick, but they end up relapsing. Just you know, take your time. Make sure you're okay before you come back. Um, as far as piercings are concerned, I don't know why people pierce. 
Here is a person that's being pierced for the specific reason of having something that lets everybody know, I'm a slave voluntarily to be here with my wife. I have chosen to be here, okay? I wasn't forced to be here. It wasn't a debtor's prison type thing, which a lot of people end up slaves because of debt. This is something I have chosen to be here, and it would be something that would be seen, okay? Um, but as far as you doing a piercing, you would not actually be doing it for the symbolism unless your master, which you have none, took you to the doorpost and put it all through your ear, okay? So no, you're, you're, you're missing the point. The symbolism doesn't have anything to do with you, okay, from that point of view. You've got lots of Torah to do that shows and demonstrates your covenanting with the Almighty, like showing up here when you're not sick, okay? These are the ways we demonstrate, and the symbolism is signs of the covenant through our behavior. So I, I'm not saying you can't get piercings, I don't have any, I have no intention to get them. I don't get why people put ink all over their body. I don't get why people put holes in their body. I think it came with the right number of holes to begin with, okay? <laughs> I mean, you know, he chose how many and put them where he wanted, and that's it, okay? But, you know, clearly people through the ages have had adornments and, and piercings and that kind of thing, and I don't see any verses that say you can't do that. All right, so that's fine. So if you want to do that, do it for whatever you want. I don't know that I'd be seeing the symbolism to this because it's stretching it a little bit for me, okay, to claim that that's what this is, okay? Remember, the symbolism here is a man wanting his wife and child so bad he was willing to stay with that slave owner, that, man, that, that owner permanently and forever, and then got the ear pierced, okay? All right, Next. Donna Stevens, 24, 7 and 8. Is this the fulfillment of the covenant of the pieces in Genesis 15, 13 through 18, or a step towards the fulfillment of it? Um, look, the covenant of the pieces is a whole different sort of deal. Um, this, this is a covenant between Yahweh and the people where Moses then, you know, reads in the book of the covenant and, and he sprinkles the blood on them, etc. The covenant of the pieces is with, with Abraham and, and, and Yahweh, and Yahweh does everything himself. Okay, he makes it more of a unilateral thing. Okay, Abraham doesn't do anything. And so I don't know that these things connect in that way. I mean, I have to go back and look at it and, and read the various verses to see if I can find some connection. I have not thought of it that way up to this point. So Donna, I don't know. I'm not going to go back to chapter 15 and figure it out at the moment, but... But, you know, one is Yahweh doing everything unilaterally, and this is something where the people are participating in a covenant, which started in Exodus 19 at Sinai and worked its way to here, okay? Yeah, hopefully that makes some sense. All right, next. Okay, from Olivia Durth, Shabbat Shalom, Rabbi, 2228. Can you explain the revile and Elohim and the cursing of a ruler? No. No, I'm kidding. All right, it says, do not revile Elohim nor curse a ruler of your people. Okay, look, it, it's, I think this is consistent with everything we've said up to this point. How you treat a ruler of the people is how you treat him, okay? And so I'd have to look up the Hebrew word and make sure of the nuances of it, how it, what it means and why they translate it as revile. But what's reviling mean? I mean, when, you know, it's to treat with utter disdain and, and disgust and that kind of thing. So reviling Elohim. He says, don't revile Elohim, nor curse a ruler. In other words, he's trying to connect those two together. How you treat vertical authority is how you treat him. And so if you're going to curse a ruler, anybody in authority above you, it's basically reviling him, saying, you're wrong to put this person in charge. You're wrong to bring this structure. You're wrong to place the, this person in this position. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay. All right, next. Okay, it's the last one. Monica de Leon, Rabbi, please, is there a relation between Moshe 40 days and Exodus 24, 18, and Yeshua being led by the Spirit 40 days into the desert? Yeah, they're both 40. <laughs> Directly related. <laughs> Look, there's not time really to go into the symbolisms of numbers but what you can see is that there are very significant numbers that pop up all the time. One of them is the 40 days, okay? 
And so you see that also that Moses fasts for the 40 days, so does Yeshua, okay? So there is a covenanting, um, major status change thing connected with 40 days. Same thing we see the number 40 with how many years they were in the wilderness. Again, major covenanting, major status changing symbology there, right? Okay, so that's really what it's talking about. So yes, there is definitely a relationship between any of the 40-day events or 40-year events, any with the number 40. Just like we see a lot of things with the number three. We see the things with the number seven. We see the things with number 10, number 12 for sure, right? Okay, so there are things that come up that we could see when we see those numbers, they tend to be related in some way. All right, same thing with 70, okay? Okay, so when they show up in Egypt, they're 70 beings. Then elders end up being 70 elders. The Sanhedrin had 70 people in it, okay, 71 with the Nasi, okay? But it's 70. And so... Yes, numbers do tell us a lot. At times, they do tell us a lot. That especially when you see the same number pop up in multiple places, there's usually something that connects them. Yes. So when you say is there a relationship between Moshe's forty days and Yeshua's forty days? Absolutely, absolutely. And we could connect lots of different things with that. There's a, there's a possibility always that we can do that. And so that being said, just realize that we can connect up lots of different numbers, and we're not going to have time to do that today. All right, that was the last one. Thank you, Monica, for that one. That was it. All right, so I hope everybody enjoyed that. Excellent job, excellent job. Okay, don't forget that tomorrow is zone one and zone two, okay? Yeah. Which feels really weird that zone two comes before zone one because I changed things. So <laughs> I almost feel, almost feel like I gotta change them back to now it's a zone one is first and make that the, the, the people in, in Europe and Africa and everything like that. But we'll leave it the way it is so we don't confuse people. So we're gonna do zone two in the morning at 10 o'clock. So basically 12 hours, a little less than 12 hours from now. And then we'll have zone one during the live service. And that's when you guys get to ask your questions, okay? So we'll be doing that with the live Beshalomers here during the service. All right, so with that, who's, who do we have for closing up? Okay, Richard, okay. So Richard Bohe is gonna come up here. Just come up here by, Paul's gonna give you the mic, okay? All right, so if you all rise, we're gonna go ahead and close in prayer. Richard Bohe is gonna go ahead and close us in prayer. Okay, right there, good. As soon as you see yourself up on the screen, you know you can start. Well, your mic's not on. Push the button for him. There you go. Evening, Father. We thank you for bringing us all here together today, feeding us with your food and with the food of uh, your Torah. Uh, we thank you for providing a teacher for us, making your word clear, helping us to walk this out. Uh, we bless you. And we ask that you would be with us all as we go our ways. In Yeshua's name and authority, amen and amen. Amen, amen. I know there's a few sleepy children that are coming. <laughs> Here's one. Okay. Ah, but she would rather be with Robinson. Okay, I got this one. All right, turn around. All right, there we go. All right. So anybody wants to be on camera, come on over here. All right. Got a few more coming. We don't have it up on the screen, so I don't know how we can see that, but all right. All right, so we want to connect with the people on the live stream. So we're going to look at the camera there where Mr. Rick's got the camera. I'm going to wish everybody out there a Rosh Chodesh Sameach, okay? A Shabbat Shalom, and then we're going to tell them that we love them. On three, here we go. One, two, three.